I got it. Um, okay. Got it. Yeah, my slideshow is supposed to be rotating. It didn't. I apologize for that. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Brooke McDonald, who is the CEO and president of the Conservation Foundation. Thank you, Jan. And thank you to everyone for joining us for our 2022 DuPage Environmental Summit. This is an annual event we do every year uh, with our partners and with our sponsors. And it's a different topic every year, a different theme. It's just interesting that every time we have a topic related to, to climate uh, change, it seems to be like minus 50 outside. So I don't know where you're at, but wherever you're at, I hope you're warm and cozy because it's really, really cold here uh, in Naperville right now. But anyways, again, thank you for joining us. I know we have a lot of people who are going to be continuing to, uh, to, to log in here, uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Brooke McDonald. I'm the president and CEO for the Conservation Foundation. Our mission is to uh, preserve and restore open space and natural lands. Uh, clean up our rivers and streams and uh, promote stewardship of the environment and uh, we we do that mission in our local communities uh, to help build uh, healthier stronger more vibrant uh, communities high quality of life places where people want to live work and raise their families uh, we've been doing it for 50 years this is our 50th anniversary uh, this year at the conservation foundation and over the past 50 years we've been able to help preserve about 35,000 acres of land throughout the Northeastern Illinois area, but mostly in DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and uh, Will County. So we are a membership supported organization. I uh, have nearly 6,000 members. I know that many of you joining us today are members. Thank you. Thank you for supporting us. If you're not a member and if you're interested in learning more about who we are and what we do and how you can become involved, uh, please visit our website. Uh, there's a lot of good information on there. We also feel that our mission is important to building resiliency uh, into the landscape, not just ecological resiliency, but also climate resiliency. And by preserving and restoring lands uh, to their natural condition, that also helps mitigate the negative impacts of climate change. That's the, the topic for this year's environmental summit, is how do we build more resiliency, climate resiliency into our, our landscape? So you're going to hear from really some excellent speakers today, and I want to thank all of our speakers, especially I'd like to thank Doug Talmy for joining us today. He's our keynote. He's joining us from the East Coast, um, and uh, I, I, I know you're just going to enjoy all of these, these wonderful presentations. I also want to um, thank our sponsors. Uh, we've been doing the Environmental Summit now for almost 20 years, and it's always been free. And the reason why it's been free is because uh, we have some some great partners and some great sponsors. You'll hear from a couple of them here in, in a minute, but I wanna thank the DuPage Foundation. I wanna thank uh, DuPage, our DuPage County Board, especially uh, Chairman Dan Cronin, and also the Cool DuPage Program. Uh, we like to work with Joy Hens uh, with the county with the Cool DuPage Program. Also the DuPage County Forest Preserve District and President Dan Hebriard, thank you for sponsoring. Also, Bill Bedrosian at uh, uh, Bedrock Earthscapes. Bill, I hope, I hope that you're on, on the call this morning here and joining us. And finally, Christopher B. Burke Engineering. Uh, Chris, I think you're, you're joining us from Florida uh, this morning. Uh, I'm sure your weather's a lot nicer down there than it is here. Chris is also uh, the chairman of our board of trustees here at the Conservation Foundation. So thank you to, uh, to all of our sponsors for helping keep this event uh, free. Uh, so anyone can join us uh, here. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to ask, uh, introduce Laura Ernst. Uh, Laura is the program manager for the DuPage Foundation. Laura, uh, please say a few words. Thanks, Brooke. It is so great to be here today for today's summit and see so many people, or at least see your names on the screen um, that are interested in environmental issues. This is the 17th year the DuPage Foundation has sponsored the Environmental Summit and we're proud to continue to do so because we know how valuable it is and how valuable the information that comes out of it is. In recent years, the impact of climate change has been so obvious throughout the whole world, but also here in the Midwest with extreme and devastating weather events. And at least from someone outside of the field, it's so hard to know what we can do about it. But it sounds like today we'll learn a few steps um, that we can take to start to make a difference in our local environment. Preserving the environment is important to the overall 
quality of life. So through the Page Foundation's Community Needs Grant Program, we support environmental organizations that benefit our local community. And our next grant application deadline for environmental programs is Friday, September 2nd. Um, details about this opportunity are available on our website, dopagefoundation.org. At the foundation, we use the tagline or motto, doing a world of good in our own backyard, which seems very fitting for today's theme and today's speakers. Um, so on behalf of everyone at the foundation, I'd like to thank you for all that you do to ensure a vibrant and healthy environment in DuPage County. Thank you, Laura. We appreciate your support. Um, I think you've you've been supporting this, the, the DuPage Foundation, for almost uh, the entire length of the, uh, that we've had the summit, minus maybe a couple of years, because I, I know we're getting close to 20 years doing this. So thank you. Of course. Um, we also uh, invited uh, DuPage County Board Chairman Dan Cronin and Forest Preserve President Dan Hebriard to join us, but we scheduled this this morning on the morning where they both have board meetings, so they couldn't join us in person, but they uh, sent a short video. So Jan, uh, why don't you uh, show the first video with uh, Chairman Cronin. Thank you so much to Brooke McDonald, Jan Rail, the Conservation Foundation Board, and all of the other sponsors for supporting this important program. When I was elected chairman of the DuPage County Board more than a decade ago, climate change was definitely on our radar. But today the issue of climate change has prompted scrutiny, studies, and policy change on a national and international scale. This year, the Global COP26 Summit was a significant part of the daily news before, during, and after the summit was held. The world has changed, and we are changing with it. Here in DuPage and our environmental summit this morning, Doug Tallamy brings a message of building resilience, which is described as the ability to adjust easily to or recover from a stress or change. You've heard me talk over the last several years about our efforts at the DuPage County government campus to plant trees, restore native vegetation, and conserve resources. We are doing our best to adapt to the already increasing storm events while preparing for the changes we need to make to our infrastructure. But I believe resiliency also means doing what you can to slow the change. If we all do our part, we can minimize the negative environmental impact on our planet and set a positive course for the next generation. With that, thank you for your time this morning and welcome. There's a lot of information to share and I hope you enjoy the summit today. Thank you, Jan. And uh, again, uh, President Dan Hebriard of the DuPage County Forest Preserve District uh, also sent a uh, short video. So Jan, go ahead and tee that one up. Hello, I'm Daniel Hebriard, president of the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County. Welcome to the 2022 Environmental Summit. Today's topic is fighting climate change. Here at the Forest Preserve District, we feel like we're taking a multi-pronged approach to fight climate change. As leaders in DuPage, we have nearly a thousand acres we're working towards restoration over the last couple of years. We've taken in nearly 11,500 animals last year at Willowbrook, and that's why we need a new animal hospital. And thankfully that new animal hospital is gonna be net zero with geothermal and a large solar array, which will be our fourth solar array in the last three years, following Blackwell's fleet building, which will be completed this year, the first 100% solar powered golf carts in the United States at the Preserve at Oak Meadows and a other solar array that already exists at Willowbrook. With nearly 26,000 acres over 60 forest preserves, one eighth of all the property in DuPage County, I hope you're taking advantage of your forest preserves. I know I do. We'll see you on a trail. There there. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So uh, did everybody see that? I saw something in the Q&A or the chat about that not 
uh, people not not seeing that video. I hope, I hope they did, or at least I hope they they, they heard it. So, anyways, uh, again, thanks for our sponsors. Uh, I want to introduce Jan here. Um, Jan is our DuPage County Program Director. Um, she is the one that organizes all these events. And Jan, I just wanted to say thank you to all of your hard work. I know you put a lot of time into this and uh, we all appreciate your, uh, your efforts. Also want to introduce Jamie Vback. Jamie is our Will County Program Director and uh, she is Jan's uh, wing woman today. Uh, so it's, it's, it's nice to have a backup a tech person in case something goes wrong. So anyways, Jan, thank you. Uh, Jan will be your MC for the rest of the day. Uh, so Jan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sounds good, thank you, Brooke. So um, I'd like to introduce Doug Tallamy. Um, he is a TA Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 106 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 41 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how much interaction determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published by Timber Press in 2007. It's an excellent book, I've read it. Uh, the Living Landscape, co-authored with Richard Dark, was published in 2014. Uh, Nature's Best Hope, um, a New York Times bestseller, I read that one too, was published in February 2020. And his latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released by Timber Press in 2021. Um, and I highly recommend it. I just finished it and it's very interesting. His awards include recognition from the Garden Writers Association, Audubon, the Garden Club of America, and the American Horticultural Association. With that, I turn it over to you, Doug. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, I do wanna talk about what I call the nature of oaks today. And what we're really doing is following the life that is associated with oak trees that I planted in my yard in the year 2000 when we moved in. So, you know, the theme of the conference is, is uh, climate resilience. And we all know that planting trees is great. And most of us know that planting oaks is one of the best things we can do in terms of sequestering carbon and creating that resiliency. What I want to talk about today is what you get in addition to climate resiliency when you put those oaks in your yard. So we moved into uh, our little home here in Oxford, Pennsylvania in the year 2000. And it, the, it was a farm that had been broken up, been mowed for hay before we moved in. So this is what it looked like, very few plants there. So our goal was to restore the biodiversity that used to be on that property. Uh, and that fall, September, October, there were some oak trees, white oak trees about a mile and a half down the road that dropped some acorns. So I got some of those acorns planted them in our front yard. I planted them all over, but we're gonna follow one particular one in our, our front yard. And the first thing that we notice, of course, is that white oaks germinate in the fall. They send down a single, single root, single radical. And that's all they do in the fall. It's not till the spring that they put up their, their leaves. And this is what it looks like uh, after they have done that. And then they don't do too much else, or at least it looks like they don't do too much else. And this is what gives uh, oaks, particularly white oaks, the reputation that they are very slow growers. They're actually not slow growers. It's just that they're the first couple of years, they are growing uh, underground much more than on top of the ground. During that first year, they're putting in 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. And that's a really important uh, time period because they are establishing a root mass uh, that will support healthy, fast growth the rest of their lives. So here's our little oak here uh, in year two. Uh, I've got a little deer fence around it. And this is, this is the oak that we're going to follow. That's what it looked like in year two. This is what it looked like 18 years later. It's 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, canopy spread of 30 feet. It's still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree. So you, you don't have to wait centuries for your oaks to become, uh, you know, if nothing else, visually attractive. One of the things I want to stress today is that oaks are a lifeline to an awful lot of species. Dozens of species of birds depend on oaks. Uh, many mammals, including rodents in the, in the large oaks that are largely gone. Big cavities in the middle, that's where bears spend the winter time, raccoons, possums. There's not that many reptiles associated with, with oaks, but there's several species of butterflies that specialize on them. Hundreds of species of moths use oaks, including the predators and parasitoids that depend on those species. Then we have cynipid gall wasps that depend on oaks. 
lots of beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, beetles, and so on. And then you drop below the oak, you look at the leaf litter under that tree and you've got a number of spiders, and dozens of arthropods, mollusks, and annelids that depend on oak leaf litter. The problem is, uh, in my view, is that this diverse web of life is, is typically, um, it goes unnoticed by the people that have oaks in their, in their yard, which means it's not appreciated. Uh, and that is why I wrote the book, The Nature of Oaks. It's a month by month guide to the life on your oaks so that we can build that appreciation. Uh, I've always believed that knowledge generates interest and then interest often generates compassion. And we need a lot more compassion towards the natural world. Um, yes, it's a mechanism for fighting climate change, but it's also a mechanism for keeping the biodiversity crisis in check, which is the second major problem that the earth is facing right now. First, a few, few facts about the, the genus Quercus. It contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. So it's a large genus for a deciduous tree. Uh, the, the word Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. So oaks are fine trees, and they are indeed. There are four major taxonomic sections in the genus that are common in North America. We have the white oak group. We call it the Quercus group. Red oak group, Lobedi. Uh, Varentes is the live oak group, and Protobalanus is the canyon oak group. It's a much smaller group in the West. This is the range of oaks uh, in North America. Every place except the brown here has at least one species of oak that, that's uh, very common. The brown areas are either too, too dry or the high northern Rockies um, where oaks just don't occur. The center of distribution, of course, is the southeast, but we've got a number of, of oaks in, in Illinois. Baroque is, is certainly one of the mag most magnificent. Oaks live a long time. 900 years average growth, uh, which surprises a lot of people. I hear people say all the time, I've got a 100 year oak in my, my yard uh, and, and they're waiting for it to die. It's still a baby. There's 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis and 300 years of decline. And each during each one of those periods of, of um, growth, oaks are delivering unique ecological uh, um, benefits to their local environment. The reason most of our oaks don't live that long is because we mess up that root system. We chop it off when we plant them, we build roads, we build sewer lines, we, we interrupt the root system, and that of course compromises the, the length of the, of the oak's age. Everybody wants to know what the, the oldest oak in the country is. Um, a lot of people will say it's the Middleton oak, a Southern live oak in, uh, I believe it, it's either Charlotte or Charleston. I always get them mixed up. It's about 1500 years old. But uh, there are much smaller oaks. There's an oak called the Palmer Oak in California that essentially clones itself. It moves along the ground. It's more or less a ground cover, uh, reroots itself. And this one in particular has been aged at 13,000 years old. So that of course swamps any, any of the big oaks. Oaks can get big, they can get enormous. This is the Y Oak in Y, Maryland. It was the largest white oak in, in North America. Uh, it fell over, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. Uh, so it's not there anymore, but it gives you an idea. They can be massive. But another point I wanna make today is that not all oaks are massive. So we can put them in smaller yards without worrying about them getting too big. Oaks have superior ecological function. Uh, they have the highest biodiversity value. We'll, we'll talk about that a lot. Um, you already know that they're sequestering more carbon dioxide uh, than just about any other tree that's out there. And there's their, there's their climate resiliency right there. Uh, because of that enormous root system on most species, they're one of the best soil stabilizers we have. They make what I call the best leaf litter, and it's the best because it lasts the longest. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. These are good things. Okay, I started my book in October. People wanna know why I started in October because that was the month that, that my wife, Cindy said, you should write a book about oaks. So, okay, I write a book about oaks. I looked out the window, it was October. That's what my oak looked like. Uh, and of course, October is, is the month that you're gonna notice acorns more than any other month. Of course, they have been on the tree for a good part of the summer, but um, we typically don't notice them. Oaks can make a lot of acorns. A single oak can produce up to 3 million acorns during its lifetime. And each one of those is a, a, you know, a wonderful little nugget of food. It's rich in fats, it's rich in proteins, and therefore there's a lot of animals that depend on, 
on acorns. Uh, certainly a lot of rodents do, but again, the big guys, uh, black bears, when they're around, will eat a lot of, of acorns and our squirrels and those cute deer we all love. But a lot of birds depend on oaks as well, particularly turkeys. Turkeys will just walk around the, the woods eating as many acorns as they can in the fall. Uh, red belly woodpeckers, titmice, towhees, um, nuthatches, flickers, many birds are using acorns, and particularly ducks, particularly wood ducks. Uh, wood ducks love acorns. They will, they will dive down uh, any acorn that has, has uh, fallen into the water. They'll dive down and eat it, and they'll come up on the shore and eat as many acorns as they can as well. There's a number of invertebrates that depend on acorns, like the acorn weevil. This is an acorn weevil tunneling out of an acorn, and that's what the adult looks like. Uh, there's a group of moths called acorn moths that do the same thing the acorn weevils do. The caterpillar develops in the acorn, then it comes out as a moth. There's several species, but they all look just like this. Very tough to separate. So with all these things eating acorns, if you look under a, an oak tree, maybe two weeks after those acorns have, have dropped, it's devastation. And, you know, there aren't any viable acorns. They've all been, been eaten or carried away or crunched. So you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. And this is where a very ancient uh, relationship between jays all over the world and oaks all over the world comes to the rescue. Uh, both jay and oak lineages uh, evolved uh, about the same time, 65 million years ago, in the same place, Southeast Asia and they developed a very close relationship. Oaks, of course, provided those acorns for jays, uh, wonderful winter food, but jays gave oaks something that uh, most other trees don't have, and that is the ability to move. This is how that works. Jays store oak, uh, acorns for, for winter use. Uh, they don't cache them, so they're not putting a whole bunch of acorns in one place the way a squirrel or something else would. Uh, they bury them singly, so they pick up an acorn, then they fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And that's the key. That is much farther than any other acorn disperser is going to move those acorns. Then they will find a, a area of ground that's been disturbed where it's easy to tap that acorn below the surface of the soil. Now, if they know uh, that another jay has watched them do that, they'll wait a few minutes and then they'll dig up their acorn and move it to a new spot. Because jays know that jays steal acorns. And then during the winter time, the, they're, they're going to go find those acorns and have something to eat. So uh, the jays are busy in the fall. A single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. But they only remember where one out of every four acorns is, which means a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees. And if they do that a mile from the original tree, that is what's allowing oaks to move farther and faster than any other uh, any other tree genus, I believe, in the world. It's not just blue jays that are doing this. We have, what, seven, eight species of jays in, in North America. This is uh, one of the scrub jays uh, on the West Coast. They all have relationship with acorns. Uh, and, and those are not the only birds that have very specialized relationship with acorns. Enter the acorn woodpecker, a very beautiful bird from the Southwest. It depends uh, almost entirely on, on acorns. And what they do is rather than bury those acorns for the winter, they create, they find a snag and they drill holes in it and create little storage containers. So they put the acorns in the holes uh, and then a family unit will guard that tree and keep all the other acorn uh, um, woodpeckers away. So there it is. They just stuff it in there and it'll spend the winter in there and then they eat them as they get hungry. But a, a, a um, acorn tree becomes a really valuable resource. It can have up to 50,000 holes drilled in it. And it's hard to do that. So they want to guard this and use it year after year. So if you have a, an acorn woodpecker tree in your yard, it, it's enormously entertaining and a very valuable resource to these birds. November is the year, the month that you, you might notice that it was either a good year for making acorns or not a good year. There's not too much in between with oaks. Uh, when they make a lot of acorns, it's called a mast year. Uh, and often they'll, they'll have a mast year. Then they make a two, three, four, five years without a mast year. And during those other years, they're producing very few or even no acorns at all. It's an unusual form of reproduction among trees. So of course, ecologists want to try to explain it. Why should oaks mast? 
well, there are four hypotheses, predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. Let's look at each one. Each one. Predator satiation, this is an acorn weevil uh, that is, uh, they can be really common in, in acorns. You can have up to 90% of the acorns inhabited by acorn weevils. So if oaks made the same number of, of acorns every year, acorn weevil populations would stabilize around that number and they'd take almost every single one. Same thing with the acorn moths, same things with the, the squirrels and all the other things that are eating acorns. Their populations would stabilize around that large number. But if oaks are really variable in when they make their acorns, so let's say they make a whole bunch one year, uh, the populations of squirrels and acorn weevils and everything else explode, then the next year there's almost no acorns. So then the populations crash. That's predator reduction. And you might go several years with very few acorns where the numbers of, of acorn eaters remain low. And then you have a big mast year. So it swamps the uh, animals that want to eat those acorns. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated. Uh, and that's a game of chance. You're releasing your pollen on the wind. Uh, that's pollen, of course, is the male uh, gamete, and it's got to reach the female flower. So if, if oak trees are releasing all their pollen at once uh, in, in very large masses, the probability of being pollinated successfully increases dramatically. And finally, energy allocation. And by the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, this is the scarlet oak. Yes, they can have good fall color. Energy allocation. There's never enough energy to go around, or at least it seems that way. So oaks partition it. Uh, in some years, they use it for growth. In other years, they use it for reproduction. But rarely do they do both at the same time in a big way. So again, these four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be happening at the same time. December is the month that you might um, notice that uh, there are many oaks, particularly in the, the white oak group, that hold on to their leaves. Now, this is a deciduous tree, and you know deciduous trees drop their leaves, but uh, many oaks hold on to them all winter long. It's a condition called marcescence. So again, an unusual behavior. Why marcescence? Well, the leading hypothesis is that it wasn't long ago eight, 9,000 years ago, which ecologically is not long. Evolutionarily, it's nothing. There were huge Pleistocene mammals that were very common, not just in North America, but, but in all the areas where there were a lot of oaks. This is the uh, group of mammals, the large mammals that occurred in Mexico alone. It had three species of mammoths, the uh, giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet. These are big, big guys. Well, many of them were browsers, which means they are eating the meristematic tissue, the buds that will come out and form next year's leaves on trees during the winter time. And if oaks surround their buds with dead leaves from the previous year, it's hard to get at the buds without getting a mouthful of very untasty material. And the distribution of, of marcescent leaves on oaks supports that hypothesis because the oaks hold the leaves only about 18 feet up. And after that, there is no more marcescence. And that's as far up as those, those mammals could reach. That uh, curious ecological behavior gives oaks a landscaping trait that most other deciduous trees don't have, and that is they can be screens even during the winter time. So if you don't like your neighbor, you want to screen them out, you can plant a, a white oak or a baroque or the other members of the white oak group and get very nice screening all winter long and summer when the leaves are out. Okay, January. It's cold in January, just like you know, it's cold. You're not outside looking up in the trees very much, but if you do, uh, you're likely to notice little birds hopping around the branches of, of oak trees. Now, when we see chickadees or, or titmice doing that, uh, we don't think much about it because those are the birds that are feeders eating seeds and we're not worried about them making it through the winter. Well, 50% of their diet is seeds during the winter time, but and then the other 50% is insects and spiders even in the winter time. But how about something like a, a golden crown kinglet that does not eat seeds? It's entirely an insectivore. It should have migrated. It's a tiny bird. It needs to eat a lot all, all day long, uh, yet they don't migrate. I took this picture during a snowstorm in my, in my backyard. Uh, and they've created what we call the, the kinglet paradox. Here's a bird that is an insectivore and it's up in the trees where there aren't any insects. So what is it doing up there? Well, Bern Heinrich, one of our uh, wonderful remaining naturalists, uh, he doesn't like 
paradoxes. So he actually looked in the crops of kinglets in Maine in January, and he found they were full of caterpillars in Maine in January. So obviously when what they're doing up in those trees is getting caterpillars, which means there are caterpillars up in our oaks in the middle of the winter. And there are, uh, they're sitting there looking like sticks. Most of them are in the family Geometridae, the inchworms, uh, and they, they really do look like sticks. Here's, here's one right here. When it gets really cold, they have antifreeze proteins in their cells that keep their cells from bursting. Uh, so they shrink a little bit, and then when it gets warm, they, they swell a little bit, but they just sit there. So now there's, there's no more uh, kinglet paradox. We know what they're doing up there. They're eating caterpillars. Uh, the next question is, what the heck are the caterpillars doing up there? Why would you be a caterpillar and spend the whole winter just sitting there when there's nothing to eat? Uh, you know, we don't know. But um, probably the best guess is that these caterpillars are, they're not completely grown, but they're almost completely gone. So they're large. Most insects overwinter as eggs. So if they hatch out, they're really tiny, easy to outcompete, or they overwinter as, as a chrysalid or a, a pupa. So they come out and they've got to find a mate and mate, and then they lay insects. If you're a large larva like this, when the leaves uh, burst forth in the springtime, you can outcompete everybody else. Uh, you've got an endless supply of food because you are so large, ready to go. February. Um, biologically, this is the quietest time of year for, for oaks. So it's a good time to look at what I call oak landscaping myths. Now, if we wanna increase uh, the use of oaks in our landscapes, we've, we've gotta address these myths because a lot of people say, I am not gonna plant an oak. I won't live long enough to enjoy it, uh, regardless of its benefits for, for climate change. Now associated with, with every myth is, is some amount of fact, or at least that's the way it, it used to be. So let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about the facts that are associated with these myths. Are oaks too expensive to use? Do they grow too slowly to use as, as landscape plants? Do they get too big to use in small lots? And if we do use them, are they gonna fall over and crush our house? Or are they gonna lift up our sidewalk or our driveway? Okay, are oaks too expensive to use? Well, they can be if you insist on planting a large oak, uh, if you insist on getting instant gratification. <clears throat> um, there is no way to grow an oak with its full uh, complement of roots um, so that it, it can continue growing at a rapid pace. Now we have figured out how to grow uh, oaks, how to grow large trees in pots without them being root bound. This is what a root bound tree looks like. The roots go around and around, <clears throat> excuse me. And when you plant that, the tree, the roots will continue to grow and then strangle the tree. Um, this is a planting of uh, oaks that I ran in, into in uh, what, Newark, Delaware, a couple summers ago. There were at least 15 trees here. They spent a lot of money putting them in and every single one died. So something went wrong when they, they chose these large trees. Um, you, can, you can plant them in pots with air, air pots. Let's go back to this where you don't get root bounding, but um, it's still a small amount of root mass compared to the size of the tree. So when you plant the tree, the first thing the tree has to do is rebuild the, the root mass. The other option is bald and burlap trees where you actually chop the roots off. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you plant the tree, Again, it's trying to survive with just a, a bare amount of, of roots. Uh, and the first thing it does is try to rebuild that root mass. And a lot of times it can't do it. You get up to 50% um, uh, mortality when you, when you plant these large trees where you've chopped off the roots. If I plant an acorn the same day that I put this tree in the yard, and I've actually done that at home, um, the acorn will germinate and grow slowly in the beginning. These guys will sit there for a decade or so trying to rebuild the root system. And by the end of that decade, this little guy here will be bigger and much healthier than these trees that you just spent $3,000 on. So this is the ideal time to plant or uh, size to plant an oak. And of course, nurseries don't like to do that because they can't charge you a lot of money, but you're guaranteed to get a healthy tree if you can keep something else from eating it when it's small. <clears throat> But again, then, then you run into the, the problem or the question, do oaks grow too slowly? When you plant a little guy, uh, it's a little guy and a lot of people want big guys. So, well, let's examine that question by having a race between my friend, Bella, who's two years old here and no, she's not my daughter, uh, but we did watch her uh, about five days a week. She was born on my wife's birthday. 
she became our sur surrogate granddaughter until we, we got some real ones. Um, here are the trees. This is the tree I planted as an acorn. It's six years old here. Um, so let's see who's going to grow fast. Everybody knows uh, that white oaks grow really, really slowly. So Bella ought to be able to catch up. So here are the trees, six years old, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Bella is losing. 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. This is 2020. Bella's got her mask on. She has clearly lost the race. She's, she's through growing. She's 5'11". She's tall, um, but not as tall as the oaks. So you know that once you get through that, that slow period there, the oaks grow as fast as anything else. And you don't have to wait uh, decades or centuries for your oaks to start to contribute in measurable ways to the life around you. Um, they're supporting the biodiversity by sharing the energy they have captured from the sun. This is a caterpillar standing on the ground, eating the leaves of a pin oak that has just popped its head above, above the leaves. So they contribute to your local food web right away. Our oaks too large to use in small lots. Well, you're not gonna get any landscape architect or landscape designer to recommend a large tree for a lot this size. But um, it happened here. It happened in an entire row along a bunch of houses in Newark, Delaware. I'm pretty sure these trees were planted the same time these houses were built. So they're more than a hundred years old. Uh, and remember in the old days, there was no air conditioning. So the oaks were, were uh, dropping the temperature of those houses by 10 degrees in the summertime. I'm sure they were welcome. They have not lifted up the hardscape. They have not fallen over and crushed the trees. But again, you're not going to get anybody to recommend a tree that big. This is a large oak um, in a very small yard next to a large church. Fortunately, they didn't take it down. It's still providing benefits, but not recommended. Point is, we've got a lot of small oaks that we need to get uh, <clears throat> more common in the trade. Dwarf chestnut oak is the most common one, Quercus prinoides. Uh, if you go a little farther south, Georgia oak has been in and out of the trade. Uh, there's a dwarf uh, live oak, Quercus virginian and minima, that can be used in the south. Um, out west, we have a number of more of, of varieties of small oaks. Uh, typically, they're not in the trade, but they could be. The yellow ones here are all the species of oaks just in Texas alone. So oaks are easy to germinate, so they're easy to get in the trade. We need to um, provide these as options for people with small properties uh, because they do exist right here in this country. This is Quercus prinotes, dwarf chestnut oak. It makes acorns when it's five feet tall. This is, I'm um, looking down on one in, in uh, my yard. Um, it's one of the best we can plant for small yards. But here's an option that uh, we should think about. It's, it's, it's coppicing. You let an oak, get up to maybe three, four inches in diameter and then cut it off in the base and it will come back as a shrub. And you could do that for a hundred years and keep your oak uh, in the form of a shrub. Uh, of course, you know, the pioneers and it wasn't that long ago before we used to coppice uh, as a regular uh, um, forest practice to produce uh, twigs for various, um, various functions. We don't do it anymore, but we could and it would get you the power uh, of oak um, vegetation in your yard. Uh, without having a big tree. Well, oaks crush your houses. They could, and of course we hear about it every time they do. The media only likes to, to report uh, terrible things. Um, and they do it because uh, of, of, typically because of the way we plant them. You hear all the time that you, you, know, you want to plant a tree and have it be a large specimen tree. You want it to be the most beautiful oak in the world and it needs space. It doesn't want to compete with any other tree. But when you do that, the root system is not able to interlock with any other tree. And, and then you get a, a wet, windy period and boom, over they go. This is the way trees grow in the forest, not just oaks, but everything. Their roots are interlocked and it forms a very stable matrix, which is extremely difficult to blow over. When you see a tree blown over in the forest, it's, it's often in a, a wetter area where the, the root system is smaller uh, and it didn't get to interlock. This is a uh, stream cut near my house to shows how, show how uh, one, two, three, four different trees have interlocked their roots. Again, extremely stable, almost impossible to blow over. If you get a tornado, it'll snap them off and there's no, no landscaping trick that's gonna protect you from tornadoes, but you can keep your trees uh, much more stabilized if you plant what I'm calling tree groves or oak groves. So instead of this, how about this? These are the two trees we got our original acorns from. Um, down the road. They're, they're white oaks. Uh, nobody planted them. They planted themselves. 
put the road in after those trees were there. That's about three foot spacing there. They are very stable. And you can say, well, they're, you know, they're not as magnificent as if they were alone. It, it's true, but you can view, view them as a group, as a little grove. Here's three oaks and in, in called the Three Sisters in Northwest Connecticut. Again, natural planning, but um, very, very stable. And this is, uh, this is not a natural planning. This is a planning at uh, Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. It's one of the DuPont estates and it's dedicated to native plants. Got a large red oak back here, hemlocks in the front, roadies, big roadies down here, some hardscape. It is a planned landscape. But uh, you know, if you've got four or five acres of lawn and you're wondering what to do with part of it, create a little tree grove like this. It's wonderful habitat. Your trees are all locked in together. Um, you can't, none of those are, are specimen plants, but you grew them as, uh, view them as a group and it's quite attractive. Will your oaks lift up your hardscape? It depends on what you plant them over. If you plant an oak over bedrock, of course the roots are going to go laterally and that's true for any tree. But if you give them a chance in deep soil, most of the species will go, go deep. Not true for willow oak, but you're not planting willow oak up there in, in Illinois anyway. Um, so here's a, a pin oak, which has uh, easily gone underneath this, this uh, road here, no problem. These are two very big red oaks at the University of Delaware. Look at the size of that tree next to the curb. No lift at all. Uh, another thing that will can cause lift is if you plant over agricultural pan, where for a century the plow went down maybe 15 inches uh, and compacted the soil underneath where that plow went, then the roots uh, of any plant will hit that and go laterally. So you want to break up your ag pans if you have them before you plant your trees. All right, March is when those leaves actually start to fall. Marcescence is over and we begin to build the leaf mat on the ground that becomes a blanket that protects our soil communities. Uh, there's a tremendous variability in oak leaves. Uh, this is just some of it. I could gather it pretty easily. This is a, um, it's an emery oak from, from Arizona. It looks like a holly. This is the willow oak because it looks like a willow leaf. This is the juvenile red oak, a mature red oak. Tremendous variation in, in oak leaf shape. Oak trees make a lot of leaves. 700,000 leaves on a, on a big oak. If you lay them out next to each other, it covers four tennis courts. And that's their job, to cover the ground, to maintain the humidity uh, that our soil community needs. There are more species of, of uh, animals that live in the soil than uh, above the soil. They're all tiny, but they're performing a very important function. They're recycling the nutrients that were in the oak leaf litter or any leaf litter so that the tree can use it again the next year. Um, a lot of people worry, well, if I leave my leaves on my flower beds, the plants won't be able to get through. Well, nobody told these, these uh, ferns here that they weren't be, gonna be able to get through and they do just, just fine. Now, if you pile your, your leaves up five feet thick, you're right, nothing's gonna get through, but a normal layer of, of leaf litter uh, will not smother your plants. Uh, tremendous number of life under underground. 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails, these little columbulins, smintheric columbulins, 90,000 proturans, those are primitive insects, uh, you practically need a microscope to see them, uh, a million nematodes, and again, these things are detritivores, they are recycling the nutrients. So when we break our leaves away, or burn them, or put them out for the trash, we're throwing away the nutrients that our trees need the following year. Um, we're also throwing away a lot of life forms that are in those leaves. And some of them are quite pretty, like the banded hair streak. The caterpillar eats this stuff. It eats dead leaves on the ground. You don't find the caterpillars because they're really hard to find in there. But when you rake it away, you've just thrown away your banded hair streaks. You've thrown away up to 70 species of litter, litter moths, moths. Uh, like the ambiguous litter moth or the American idea, the dark spotted palthus and 67 other species where the caterpillars are eating these, these dead leaves. You're also throwing away the predators that keep those, those uh, moths in check. You know, when you see uh, birds like, like uh, the various thrushes, um, towhees, all these things that are hopping on the ground and pushing leaves back, they're searching for all of that food in there. So you're throwing away a, a tremendous amount of bird food as well from those ground feeders and all the predators that, that are associated with them. So my point is that, that oak leaf litter is extremely valuable in terms of preserving our, our uh, soil communities. There's something I'm forgetting to tell you and I can't remember what it is. Oh yeah, the oak leaf litter, a single leaf will 
last up to three years uh, before it breaks down. And that's really important because uh, leaves like um, maple leaves or birch leaves or tulip tree leaves, they don't even make it through a single season. They degrade really, really quickly and that leaves you bare soil and bare soil destroys that, that uh, soil community. Okay, April is when the, the buds finally uh, break out and you get the start of the new biological year. It's also the time of year that you have the option of seeing one of the most ephemeral biological interactions that happens all of nature um, and only lasts about, about five minutes. Got to be in the right place at the right time. But I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of, of uh, your oaks. This is a cynipid female. That's her ovipositor. She's injecting an egg into that bud. This is a male that has already mated with her and he's hanging around because after she lays this egg, he wants to mate with her again. So that the next time she lays an egg, uh, it'll be his sperm that she uses to uh, father those offspring. This is a male that wishes he was this male. And if he gets the opportunity, he will, he will do that. So here's a female, she's laying her egg, but she's also injecting the stem cells, the meristematic undifferentiated cells in a bud with plant hormones that manipulates the growth of those cells into a form uh, that we call a gall. People call it a cancerous growth. I don't like that analogy because cancers grow uncontrolled. They just keep growing and growing. Gall growth uh, is extremely controlled. It's controlled by hormones from the, the galler and also hormones from the plant. So the resulting gall is, an, is a compromise between the cynipid and the oak. This is a female uh, galler that was laying a, a, an, an egg in my oak buds last spring. And that is the gall that resulted from that. I put a little tag around so I could follow it. Uh, there are a lot of species of, of gallers out there. And, and I actually, could be controversial. I've always read it's 5,000 species of snippet gallers, but this morning I read it's 1,000. Either way, it's a lot of species. You can have up to 70 species of gallers on a single oak tree. Uh, and if you look in the galls, many of them are hollow, which is curious. Why are they hollow? The, the galler itself is in a central disc here. It's very hard. Uh, and then you got a lot of space uh, till you get to the outside of the gall. So what is all this air, air about? Well, it turns out that cynipid gallers um, host more parasitoids, other species of wasps that develop within them than any other type of insect. They are clobbered by natural enemies. This is one of them, a pterymid wasp, and you can see it's got a very long ovipositor. Well, if this ovipositor can reach the cynipid inside of a gall, then the, the, the cynipid is a goner. So the cynipid has manipulated the gall so that the distance from the outside of the gall is bigger than the length of the, the um, parasitoids that wanna hit that galler so that the galler can develop without being parasitoid. In the beginning, when the gall is just expanding, uh, the, the parasitoid can reach the galler, but that's a brief period and that, that means some of the cynipids actually make it. Here's a pterymid in California, Pterymus californicus, uh, which has a really long ovipositor, and it has created the, the development of the biggest gall we have in the country. Uh, this is uh, the, it's a very common gall on, on Quercus gariana, the Oregon oak, and it's so big because the ovipositor of that little wasp, it's gotta out, out distance it from the galler that's in the middle. A lot of variation in, in gall morphology. Uh, some of them are quite pretty. Uh, some of them look uh, like, like uh, plant diseases. There are a lot of galls out there, 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies, and, and many of them are cynipids on oaks. Some are on the leaves, some are on the stems, some look like candy, um, some look like that. Uh, many of them look like plant diseases. We mistake them for diseases. Some are spindle galls. Some are that, um, some are pretty fantastic and some look like pottery. This is one in my own, my own yard. Some look like little gnome houses. Um, some look like brains, so a lot of variation. This is a very curious gall. There are four galls here on a single oak leaf uh, and uh, a number of gallers emerged from each one of them. So this one gall leaf produced, what? A couple hundred uh, cynipid gall wasps. And galls have uh, an interesting history with our own recorded history. Because when you grind up a gall like this and you add particular chemicals, that hole there, by the way, is where the galler emerged. 
uh, it, you create an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that our recorded history was recorded with for thousands of years. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with, with gall ink. Um, the, all of the, the, what the monks and, uh, in the Middle Ages and the scribes wrote down was written with gall ink. So uh, the, the, the existence of gall ink really played an important part of our recorded history. May is the year that, that uh, the oak leaves fully expand and life really gets underway in, in our yards uh, because that's of course when, when sleeves all over the, the temperate zone are expanding and following those leaf expansions come the caterpillars that eat those leaves and following the appearance of those caterpillars comes the migrating birds that eat those caterpillars. It is not a coincidence that our migrants are moving up right when we have all those caterpillars eating the green leaves. Why? Because that's what's fueling the, the migration. There aren't any seeds and berries around in the springtime uh, because the plants haven't made them yet. So it's those caterpillars that are fueling the migration. Uh, and birders know, not just the migration, but you know, reproduction once the birds get here. Birders know that if you want to see warblers you, during migration, you go to oak trees because that's where most of the food is. I actually had a student, Christy Beal, several years ago, look at the number of minutes that warblers were foraging on oaks uh, in, in large trees and cemeteries. So this first bar here are the Phagaceae, that's the family that oaks are in, also beeches and chestnuts, but there were no beeches and chestnuts in her, her study. So compared to pines, compared to be, uh, birches, so on. They spend very little time in the other plants because this is where the caterpillars are. Things like the, the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panapoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, and they're called slug moths because their head is tucked up underneath and they kind of look like slugs, but they're not slugs at all. The streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak caterpillar, my favorite, the spun glass slug, and literally hundreds more species of moths use oaks all over the country. There are uh, 900, over 950 species of moths that use oak nationwide, and there's no other plant genus that comes close to that. This is what our house looks like today. Well, and during the summertime, um, we put a lot of plants back. And I noticed right away when I put the plants back, so comes the life back. Uh, and since we moved in in the year 2000, we have learned that caterpillars are the most important component of terrestrial food webs. So if you count them, you have a very good measure of how successful your food web is, how many species it's supporting. So four years ago, I started to take pictures of all the moths uh, that I could find in my yard. I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,140 species of moths that are recorded so far. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Here's the key, 30% of them are using the oaks that I put in my yard. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses and oaks are the most important keystone plant in 84% of the counties in which they occur. So they're vital in terms of supporting the life around you. You might wonder why we need so many caterpillars. It's because they're really good to eat and an awful lot of birds depend on them, not just birds, but people like birds. So that's what I talk about. For example, the chickadees that require 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one nest, to get one nest of, of offspring to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And this depends on the number of chicks in the nest. And of course, after they fledge, um, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. But they're flying all around and, parent, and we haven't been able to count those. So, But you're talking about really tens of thousands of, of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. And we want... We want entire communities of many species of birds. This is why we need the plants that make those caterpillars or we have failed food webs. Okay, June. Uh, this year, June was cicada month. 
I don't think you folks uh, near Chicago had had uh, cicadas, but we had the periodical cicada. We were all looking forward to it. As Mike Raup at the University of Maryland said, uh, this is this is the Super Bowl for entomologists when the 17-year cicadas come out. There's also a 13-year brood uh, that uh, is a little bit farther south. But of course, we knew it was coming because it, it's very regular, it comes every 17 years. And that means the media was telling us this is something we should fear. It's a terrible scourge. They're going to be so loud. It's going to drive us crazy and mothers will kill their babies. Um, it's an invasion. Stay inside. Everything they said was, was negative about it. I say it's none of those things. It's one of the most fantastic biological events that you'll ever be privileged to, to witness. Now, I am uh, just turned 70 this year. So the next time I'll see these guys, I'll be 87. So I took advantage uh, this time, because who knows what's going to happen by the time I'm 87, if I'm 87. It was a big emergence. Um, there are a lot of, of cicadas. These are the uh, shed exuvii. And when they emerge from the, the soil, they have aerated the soil. They leave these, these tunnels that uh, allows moisture and, and oxygen and nutrients to get down to the roots. It's a valuable um, contribution to plant growth. But there were a lot of them uh, in, in Newark, Delaware, uh, and so many that 11 Mississippi kites flew up from someplace and spent two weeks uh, eating our cicadas. So there were more people coming to see the Mississippi kites than, than cared about the cicadas. Here's the uh, lifespan, the average lifespan. And of course, we have annual cicadas that come out every year, but never in big numbers uh, and never highly synchronized. These guys all come out uh, very close to each other. They usually come up at night. They always, well, usually at night, because this is a dangerous time. The adult is going to emerge from this last instar. They have been spending 17 years underground sucking xylem from plant roots. They're done doing that now. They've crawled up, the skin splits, the adult swings up and hangs from it. And, and it's like a soft shell crab here. It has not tanned its exoskeleton. It's not hardened it up. So it's extremely vulnerable. That's why it happens at night. But it sits there for a couple hours and pretty soon it is all black and orange. The annual cicadas typically are, are uh, black and green. And then this guy can fly off and start his life. If he's a male, he's going to sing. And the louder he sings, the bigger the chance that he will attract a female. Um, this is why they're, they're trying to make a lot of noise. They have a tympanum in their thorax that uh, muscles move it back and forth and it forms a click when, it, when that happens. So uh, imagine clicking a Coke can, click, 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 click. This happens something like 400 times a second and that creates an audible buzz. And again, the louder he is, the more females he's gonna attract. Here, he's done it, he's attracted a female. They're mating successfully. Now she has to lay eggs. Uh, here she is uh, trying to get her ovipositor into a pinout branch right in front of my house. If you ever get a pin and try to stick it into a, an oak branch, that's really hard. You're going to bend your pin. But somehow she manages to get that ovipositor in there. She can, she can really work it down. And then she lays an egg. She inserts an egg here and an egg here and an egg here and an egg, egg there, You know, maybe six or seven eggs in a row. Then she'll go to another branch and do the same thing again. From the point where she lays her eggs out, the branch often dies, and that's called flagging. And again, people get upset. Oh, it's going to kill our tree. Not going to kill your tree. It's nature's pruners. It happens once every 17 years. Uh, your trees can, can stand it. The little guys hatch, and I used to say parachute to the ground, but somebody really believed me. There are no parachutes. They just fall to the ground and, and tunnel their way under the soil and start sucking on the xylem of plant roots. Uh, now, now, xylem is practically water. There's very few nutrients in it. So you can have up to 50,000 nymphs on an oak tree, its, its roots, with no measurable um, slowing of growth, no measurable effect at all. I had a student look at, at uh, where the uh, cicadas preferred to lay their eggs by looking at, at um, flagging, again, in, in Newark, Delaware this summer. So the green bars are different species of oaks. It really does seem like they preferred oaks over other trees. And then they die. And that's the end of their life cycle. We won't see them for another 17 years. Why are they staying underground 17 years? 
Well, again, it's predator satiation. There is no predator population that can only eat once every 17 years. Uh, so there are things that eat cicadas. All those mammals grab them. It's a, it's a wonderful food and a lot of birds eat them, but their populations are much smaller than the number of cicadas that come out periodically like that. So it's predator satiation, predator swamping. July uh, is when the night chorus begins. And by night chorus, I'm talking about singing Katie Dids. Now I used to, to uh, do a lot of camping in North Jersey and Katie did singing at night, used to sing me to sleep. It's a, it's a wonderful memory. What they do, this is a male. He raises his, his uh, four wings and rubs them back and forth against each other. There's a scraper and a file there and it produces an audible sound. So why do Katie did sing at night? Well, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. Yeah, and that's a very, very soothing sound to me. When you get a lot of them going, it can be pretty noisy at, at night. Um, this is the female. Now she's a fifth in star. She hasn't uh, expanded her wings yet, but her ovipositor is ready to go. There are four species of katydids that are common in our oak forest. Um, here she is uh, with fully expanded wings. And again, there's the ovipositor. And she's going to cement very flat eggs uh, against some stick somewhere. So sometimes you find those here. These guys have already hatched and you wonder what they are. Those are katydid eggs. Um, so why so loud? Well, it's the same. Same reason, the loudest male gets more matings than, than uh, males that are not as loud. And females like loudness because it's a, it's a measure of male quality. Uh, bigger males are louder. Uh, and if you're bigger, it suggests you've got really good genes. The Katie Dids will sing uh, through the rest of July and uh, well into August. And if you have a, a fairly warm fall, they'll sing into September and, and October as well. August is a time when it's really hard to eat oak leaves because oak leaves have been getting tougher all season long. They've got a lot of lignans in them and a lot of tannins. Uh, and in order to eat an oak leaf in August, you have to have special adaptations and gregarious feeding is one of them. Apparently when you put a lot of mouths together, you can get through that tough material. This is a yellow neck caterpillar aggregation when uh, they're small. And here it is when they're in their last instar. They can go through a, a lot of leaf material but it's a common adaptation. The uh, um, orange humped oakworm does the same thing, the pink striped oakworms. Many of the caterpillars that feed on oaks are gregarious in September, I mean in, in August. Here's our tree. In 2014, I walked around the, the base of this tree and I counted all the caterpillars uh, just at head height. There were 410 of them, but 115 were the large yellow neck caterpillars and they were eating a lot of leaf material. Um, so, you know, typically, if I, if I uh, knock on your door and you see you've got you know, 410 caterpillars eating your oak tree, people get upset, get the spray can, kill the, kill the caterpillars before they kill the tree. They're not going to kill the tree. Oaks are particularly good at sharing their, their, the energy they have captured from the sun. And because they're willing to do that, share it with caterpillars, then you have birds and lots of other living things in your yard. And it's okay because look, I took this picture right after I counted all those caterpillars. You can't see a single one and you can't see any of the caterpillar damage. Tammany Baumgarten at the, in, in New Orleans says, we should all practice the 10 step program. We take 10 steps back from our trees and all of our insect problems disappear. That's an easy way to have pest control. There's another way to eat, eat uh, leaves during August and that is to get so small you, you become a leaf miner. All the toughness is in the cuticle, the upper and lower epidermis, the palisade mesophyll, the parenchymal cells are, are um, nice and juicy and that's where the nutrients are. So if you get so skinny and small that you can mine between those leaves, you can eat the oak leaf. Um, and here's a caterpillar doing just that. It uh, forms a serpentine mine because it looks like a snake. The egg was laid here and the caterpillar hatches and eats along. The dark line in the middle is it's, it's poops, it's frass. Then right here it, it uh, pupated and that's all the leaf material it's gonna eat. This is a blotch mine. There's the caterpillar right there. It just goes in a circle, making this bigger and bigger. There it is, backlit. You can see it clearly. And here it is, a very nice picture by Salvador Vitanza. Um, 
doesn't look much like a typical caterpillar. Uh, because it's got to be adapted to feeding in a really skinny place. But the adults that emerge do look like typical moths. They're small, but they're, they're small and they're often um, quite beautiful. This is uh, one of the Camomeria species on oaks, the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner. They're very common on oaks in August. Okay, September. Now this is when we, we first start hearing our crickets typically the black crickets on the ground. And we all know that if a cricket gets in your house and sings, it's good luck. Well, there are crickets on trees too. The uh, bush and tree crickets that are uh, either light green um, or, or brownish. And they're up on, on trees singing away, you know, and they're doing the same thing. It's the male singing. They're trying to attract females by singing as loudly as they can. Uh, but here's, here's a male who has figured out how to do that uh, in a really effective way. He finds a hole in the leaf and there are species where they actually chew the hole in the leaf of an appropriate size. Then they stick their head through it, raise their wings, sing. Uh, and leaves are typically have a little bit of a parabolic shape. So it projects the sound out farther and louder than if he were singing on a flat surface. So he's sending the female a false message. He says, I'm bigger uh, than I really am. And she falls for it. She comes and she mates with him. So he's not that big but he is pretty smart. So maybe she, she's not losing after all. Uh, September is also the time you're most likely to see uh, walking sticks. They're almost never very common, although there are records of walking sticks being so common in West Virginia that they caused a defoliation in oak forests. I've never seen that. They're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. The, uh, they spend most of their time in the canopy of trees. Here's one on an emery oak in Arizona. Uh, but again, they're up in the canopy and the females walk along and just drop eggs to the forest floor. Uh, those eggs look a little bit like the seeds of, of um, spring ephemerals that have eliosomes on them, which are good to eat. Uh, ants love eliosomes. They will bring the seed back to the nest, eat the eliosome off of it, and then discard the seed. Well, these, these, uh, Walking stick eggs look like seeds like that, and they pick it up and they will take it back to the nest, the ants will, uh, and realize, well, this is not edible, and they'll throw it away in their, their garbage can, which is just below the surface of the soil, and it's a very safe place for these, these uh, walking stick eggs to develop. Some will hatch that year, some will hatch the year after, and a few will wait even three years before they, they hatch. It's called bet hedging to make sure they don't come out in a, in a bad year. All right, we have rushed through the entire year. There are a lot more things going on in your oaks than I had time to cover. But um, let's end by talking about some serious issues like this biodiversity crisis we have created. We got two major problems on the planet. One is climate change for sure, but the other is, is uh, the biodiversity crisis. We're killing the life systems that support us. We hear about birds disappearing. We've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Uh, we've got global insect decline, they're disappearing. They're not disappearing, there's nothing mysterious about it. We are killing them. And that's why we are in the, the sixth great extinction event that the earth has ever experienced. And whether or not we had any climate change issues, we would still have a biodiversity crisis. So it's a global crisis, it's very serious. Uh, we have to, we have to um, resolve it, we really do. There's no other, other option. And lucky for us, it's got a grassroots solution, one that does not depend on, on governmental decisions. It depends on you and me actually taking action. There are four things that every landscape everywhere has to accomplish today if we're going to develop a sustainable relationship with the planet that supports us. Of course, uh, every landscape has to be pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, tying it up in plant tissues and pumping the extra carbon into the soil. Um, you know, plant roots are putting a lot of carbon into the soil, and that's why prairie ecosystems uh, sequester almost as much carbon as an oak forest because of what those roots are doing. So we got to capture carbon. We've got to manage the watershed. Every landscape is in a watershed someplace, and we humans do not have the ethical right to, to manage that landscape in a way that destroys the watershed. And I'm thinking of big lawns. That's what big lawns do. We have to support a diverse community of pollinators not because they pollinate our crops. You know, May Berenbaum, University of Illinois said, well, you know, it's not really 30%, it's about 12% that, that our pollinators are contributing to crop pollination. Important, 
But what's more important is that they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all pollinating of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. We need pollinators everywhere, not just next to, to uh, not just next to crops, because we need plants everywhere. And finally, every landscape has to support a complex uh, food web that is supporting all the animals that, that run the ecosystems we depend on. When you plant an oak, you are addressing three of those four major ecological goals. You're sequestering more carbon. You're managing the watershed with those huge root systems better than other plants. You are supporting a, the more, most complex food web of any plant genus in the country. The only thing you're not doing better than other plants is supporting pollinators because oaks are wind pollinated. Although there is some evidence that uh, many pollinators use oak pollen when it's available, they just don't move it around and pollinate. So three out of four is pretty, pretty good. Despite these wonderful landscape attributes, these wonderful ecological attributes, um, oaks are now in trouble like so many other things. The old giants from our forests are largely gone. Uh, they were the first to go because they provided so much wood. The percentage of oaks in our Eastern forest has been cut in half over the last hundred years because we've, we've uh, eliminated uh, fire as a management tool, and that's that encourages oaks. We've introduced a number of serious problems, excuse me, like, like gypsy moth, a number of diseases, oak welt, bacterial leaf scorch, uh, sudden oak death syndrome. All of them are taking a heavy toll. Habitat fragmentation has isolated many of our oaks to the point where the pollen doesn't reach them, so they're not making uh, the, the acorns anymore. Uh, and if you put all those things together, it explains why 28 of our 91 North American oak species are now threatened, and one third of the oaks globally are endangered. The Oregon white oak, for example, uh, used to occur abundantly from mid-California all the way up through Washington state. It's lost 97% of its range. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in, in Great Britain. We humans live our lives out during a very brief instant in, in ecological time, and we can't return those giant oaks to the forest uh, during that time, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, those, those small oaks will be large enough to, to assume their keystone positions in our yards and our restorations, um, sequester a lot of carbon, but support the life around us better than any other tree. Everybody in the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because everybody in the planet requires good earth stewardship. We all require healthy ecosystems. The best way to express your responsibility towards stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of turkeys, chickadees, woodpeckers, warblers, jays, thrushes, emeralds, uh, prominents, gallers, weevils, orthopterans, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, I'm gonna, Jamie has been monitoring the question. So I am gonna let her go ahead and, and ask you the questions that have come up in our question and answer session. Yes, <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Talamy. This has been really, really awesome. We've got some really good questions here in our Q&A box. So um, it's all right with you. We'll go ahead and get started on those. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Um, do you know, do you need to plant two of the same species of oaks to get pollination or are they self-pollinating? Um, no, they're not self-pollinating. They both produce male and female flowers, but asynchronously. So the pollen from one tree needs to go to a pollen of another tree uh, because the female flowers from that tree are not ready yet. So yes, you need more than, than one individual to get good pollination. All right. Um, Earlier on in your presentation, you talked about uh, turning oaks into shrubs. And Richard would like to know, is the 20 year old oak full size now or will it get bigger? How will its size compare to a dwarf species? No, it's gonna get much bigger. <laughs> it's, this, is, this is the white oak, you know, they, remember the picture of the Y oak I showed you? They can get really large. Um, so no, it's not a dwarf species. There are dwarf species that, that you know, will top out at, at uh, 15 feet, no problem. 
Um, that would be the, the dwarf chestnut oak. There's a dwarf chinkapin oak. Um, some of the oaks on our sand barrens, uh, you know, scrub oak, uh, bear oak, they're, they're quite small. So we do have small varieties, but white oak is not one of them. All right. Um, so obviously we want to reduce the size of our lawns however we can. However, for those of us who live in the suburbs and, and do have some lawns, um, Susan would like to know, what can you do about the leaf litter in a manicured lawn setting when you're unable to leave the leaves in the entire yard? You know, my son bought a house a couple of years ago and the first fall he called me up and he said, dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with the leaves? I said, put them in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. <laughs> Great answer. Every, every tree in your yard should have a big bed underneath it, even if there's no plants in it. And that's where your leaf litter go. That creates a soft landing site for all of the caterpillars up in those trees. Many of them pupate in the leaf litter or they get underground. So that's where you, you rake your leaves, but you can plant right through it. Create a layered landscape, put shrubs on there, put your blueberry bushes, put your spring ephemerals. Uh, and that is how you reduce the lawn. The lawn you keep, yes, you've got to remove the leaves from them, but it should be it should be swaths of lawn, not not wall to wall carpeting, um, and it's that should give you plenty of area to to put those those leaves. Great. Uh, Mark would like to know: Does an acorn need any kind of prep to germinate, or can they just be put into the ground? They can just be put in the ground, but keep in mind the red oak group is going to germinate in the spring. The white oak group germinates in the fall, so that's got to go in the ground right away, soon after it falls. The red oak group you can put in, in uh, peat moss in a Ziploc bag and just put it in your refrigerator all, all winter. The biggest challenge to getting acorns to become trees is to keep something from eating them. So the rodents want to eat them all winter long. Um, the squirrels, they'll dig them up even after they've germinated, they'll dig them up to get that acorn that's still attached to the small trees. Uh, so that's the challenge. If you put them in a pot in the fall, that's fine, but those mice get in those pots too. And it's hard to, you know, you have to be smarter than the mice. And, you know, we think we can do that. Some, usually I'm not smarter than mice, but <laughs> that's, that's the challenge. But germinating yeah. is not, I mean, they're very easy to germinate. Those mice can get, uh, be pretty tricky there. Um, uh, kind of along those lines, why might a 150 year old red oak stop producing acorns? Uh, well, I don't know, uh, a healthy 150 year acre. First of all, are you sure it's stopped? It can stop for five years in a row and then have a big mast and you just, you just think it's stopped. Maybe it's, it's buddies around it have been taken down for some reason and it's too isolated to receive pollen from another red oak. I'm just guessing, but there's no reason why our 150 year old red oak should, should stop if it's healthy and it's got surrounding other red oaks. That's kind of what I was thinking too, that, it, yeah, I know, because sometimes even fruit producing trees, if there's a cold snap at the wrong time, that can damage the flowers and things like that too. Great. Um, Ed would like to know, um, what do you know about the, the failure of oak regeneration in many of our spaces? You know, we're seeing all these older trees, but very few of the seedlings. What might cause that? deer. We have overabundance of white-tailed deer almost everywhere, and the very first thing they will eat in the spring are those germinating oaks. So uh, that would be my first guess. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, well, it's deer. You know, another, I can't think of another reason why acorns that fall to the ground, some of them don't, don't germinate. Uh, you know, people don't think, we like to see the deer, um, we don't like to, to control their numbers. It's not the deer's fault that we have too many of them, but we've removed their predators. So we have to manage them in some way. But that is why I, when, when I'm putting an oak in the ground, I put a cage around it because if I don't, it, is, it will not make it through the first year. It won't make it through the first month. Yeah, definitely. I, deer are a huge problem. I've, I've seen experiments our local forest preserve district have done where they put up an exclosure just a little fence around a certain area in the woods. And it's amazing to see all the things that grow inside that little exclosure, even if it's just, you know, five feet by five feet versus the entire forest around it. It's, it's really amazing to see. Yeah. 
Um, all right. Um, is it important which kind of oak you plant in your specific location or what not to plant? Uh, it can be important. First of all, plant a native oak because you can, you can uh, buy sawtooth oak from China. As a matter of fact, it's been used as in wildlife areas for a long time because it makes lots of acorns. As if our acorns, our oaks don't make acorns. Um, and, and it's since been shown those acorns are often too bitter and the wildlife don't even eat them, but it's now an invasive species in a lot of places. So no reason to plant a non-native oak uh, at when you've got 91 species to choose from, but you really don't have 91 species. You've got to choose an oak from that, that should be in your area. Some oaks like basic soil, some like oaks like uh, acidic soil, some like their feet wet, like pin oak and swamp white oak. Uh, swamp chestnut oak. Some do well on dry rocky uh, outcrops like chestnut oak. Uh, white oak does well in um, places like that. So it depends on the, the ecological constraints of where you actually are that dictates which oak wants to be where you are. And the easiest way to figure that is to look around you. What oaks are growing right where near where you are? And that's probably the way you should go. Excellent point. Excellent point. Um, because like along those lines, Patricia asked, what's a good landscape oak tree for a small yard in Illinois? If it's really a small yard, I would say Quercus prinoides, the dwarf, dwarf chestnut oak. Great. Um, so you talked a lot about galls, which I find really interesting. I didn't, I had no idea there were so many different kinds. That's awesome. Um, are they somehow beneficial to the tree at all? Or is it just kind of one of those doesn't hurt the tree, but it also doesn't help? Uh, no, they're not beneficial to the tree. Um, you know, the caterpillars aren't beneficial to the tree either. It's just part of the system. Uh, the, the tree is gathering energy from the sun and it really does want to use it all for its own growth and reproduction. But if it doesn't share it, even if it's reluctant sharing, then you don't have any other life forms. So we're very happy that, that other organisms have figured out ways to get around the way trees protect their, their energy. Um, but no, it's not a mutualism. It, it is a type of herbivory. There are non-native cynipids and invasive cynipids that are here without all of those natural enemies that are controlling them. And they can be causing problems, particularly in urban areas where you get an oak with you know 30,000 galls on it and, and that can be damaging. But that's typically an invasive cynipid. And same thing, the invasive insects are bad. They're doing bad things, I should say. They're not <laughs> not inherently bad, but yeah. Yes. Um, along those lines, Robin asks, is there any research on jumping worms impact on oaks? That's a kind of a new invasive issue that we're having here in Chicago. Right. No, but there's research a little bit. There's not enough research on jumping worms, period. But there's a little bit of research of oaks impact on, on jumping worms. Um, and uh, there was, there was a, a woman who worked on, on those Asian worms. I haven't, I think she gave it up, but she was, this was about 15 years ago. She was working on them in, in Maryland. And one thing she said to me that was hopeful is that uh, they do poorly on oak leaf litter. They don't like it, it's too tough. So when you have a good amount of oak leaf litter in your forest, you, you usually have few or no jumping worms. Now I've had people send me emails saying, oh, that's not true in my yard. You know, but um, that's the only thing I've ever heard is that um, they will take other leaf litter first. So it's a good reason, if that's true, and it'd be great to document it, it's a good reason to increase the percentage. Another reason to increase the percentage of oaks in our forest to increase the, the leaf load that's uh, on the ground because those, those worms, it's, it's another invasive species that's just wreaking havoc. It's terrible. So what are some... Uh, good companion things to plant underneath oaks as an alternative to grass? Well, you know, particularly as you move further west and in, in, in Illinois, you've, you're starting to get there. You've got uh, oak savannas where the oaks start to get spread out a little bit more. You have a little bit less rain. And oak savanna, of course, is an oak in the middle of a prairie. So all those prairie plants uh, will do do well in and around, uh, particularly burr oaks. Um, in in if you know your oak is acid loving, then acid loving plants do well. Azaleas, uh, blueberries, uh, rhododendrons. So it depends on where you are. Okay, um, let's see. 
how best can we support our forest to um, help with the generation of regeneration of oaks? Um, well, uh, we know that that uh, on some level, oaks are fire climax community. They like to go through periodic burns that keep things like cherries and maples uh, less dense. Um, so having periodic burns is a, is a great way to encourage oaks. Uh, but I'm going to come back to those those deer. Deer are doing two things. They're they're eating all the regenerating, not just oaks, but everything else, uh, and ignoring the invasive plants. So the reason buckthorn and, and all of the other invasives that we have, one of the reasons is that the deer won't eat them. So they eat the natives, don't eat the non-natives, and it tips the competitive balance. When you exclude deer and you have a competition between native plants and these invasives, the natives do pretty well. There we say the, the, the invasives are much more competitive. In most cases, they're really not. It's just that um, the deer are tipping that competitive balance. So controlling our deer numbers is another way to regenerate the understory of our, our trees, our, our forest. Most plants in an understory of a healthy forest are young canopy trees. They're just sitting there waiting for a light gap to open up. We always think it's trees, then shrubs, then other things. There are some shrubs in there, but it's mostly young canopy trees uh, that right now are pretty much gone because the deer have eliminated them. Gap dynamics. I remember studying that when I was in college and it's just a fascinating thing about how they just sort of sit there waiting for that light and then just boom, take off whenever something falls. It's really, really interesting to me anyway. Um, Jill would like to know, is planting oak trees a solution that's specific to just the Midwest or where can consumers go to find native tree solutions based on where they live in the country? No, it's a great solution ev everywhere except where oaks don't don't occur. So go back to that map of oak, oak distributions. It's not a good solution in the Northern Rockies. Um, it's not a solution in, in desert regions. Uh, you know, in, in some of those riparian uh, areas, then cottonwoods become really important. But in most areas of the country, oaks are a really good solution to climate and biodiversity issues. So I'm seeing a lot of questions here. Um, people are wanting to know more about planting groups of trees together. So um, if you have a mature tree, is it then okay to plant a seedling nearby or how close should they be planted together to help strengthen those root systems? That's another fascinating topic to me. Right. Almost no research has been done on this and, and you can see why. It will take decades to come up with these answers, but it'd be great for people, somebody to start. Um, these are predictions that people are starting to make based on, on logic. And it's all, the idea is that these plants start young together so they can interlock their roots from the start. I think if you plant a small tree close enough to a big tree to interlock roots, the big tree is going to really outcompete it. And the tr small tree will do just what we said. It'll sit there for decades waiting for the big tree to, to die. Um, so that little tree is not going to anchor that big tree's root system. Um, so you really want to start small, be happy with those tiny trees and protect them, and then they will grow up together inter interlocked. But um, this is based on logic and not on, on 100 years of, of data. It'd be, it'd be great to get that. Yeah, definitely. And and I hate to say it, but I, I feel like that's something that just hasn't really occurred to folks before recently. Yeah, and I don't want to take credit for it. I heard about it in a talk down south. I can't remember the guy's name. I said, wow, that, you know, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so it's it's word of mouth now. <laughs> and well, and it's interesting because I've I've heard something about that recently too, even with Forbes when you plant native prairie plants, if you plant them too far apart, they have a tendency to be floppy and that part of the reason right, right. is that competition. Interesting. Um, so, so Jamie, I'm gonna jump in here. We have about, uh, we have one minute left. Um, yep. I wanna thank Dr. Talmy for your presentation. This was wonderful. There's been a lot of comments in the questions and in the chat, how wonderful it is. And they've learned a lot from this. 
And if you still have questions, there's quite a few we didn't get to, but I do want to stay on schedule. Uh, please email me. I'll put my email in. Uh, Jamie, if you're willing to volunteer, I'll put yours in there too. Uh, sure, but we'll try you. and answer the questions. But a great resource for information about Oaks is at the Morton Arboretum website. They have resources there. So if you have questions about Oaks, uh, they have lots of information on their website and, and the resources too, and they're experts on trees and they can probably help you out. There's a lot of questions about the oak wilt that's out there too, so they can probably help you out with that. So with that, I want to say thank you, Dr. Salmi. It's been a pleasure meeting you, even though it's virtual. And yeah. it's great because we could do it all, all this far away. That's right. That's right. All right. Have a good conference, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. So with that, um, I'm moving on to our next presenter, uh, Jim Kleinwachter, who's with the Conservation Foundation. Uh, he's a director of that program, and he's, his presentation is about building resiliency in your yard with uh, conservation at home. Uh, his pre presentation is 15 minutes long, and after that, we will have a that you can, all can take and uh, take a rest real quick. Hello, thank you, Jan, for that um, preview. Um, I'm assuming you can see the presentation. Everything came up okay? Yes, it's working. All right. Um, building on what uh, Dr. Tallamy talked about, it's a perfect segue to what we do with uh, our areas in um, Northern Illinois. So the Conservation Foundation works across a broad region and What's happened across our area is we lost a lot of the natural landscape and it's mostly suburban areas and we've changed everything and it's been a detrimental change to the environment. So how are we gonna go from here? And I think Dr. Tallamy did a great job talking about why we need to change things and why we need to go back to the way we were. And the big question that I'm gonna to try to address is how we are gonna do that. Our main office is in Naperville on the McDonald farm and it's 60 acres permanently protected with a conservation easement. And 49 acres are in organic vegetables. If you haven't been down, certainly come down. Even if you've been there before, we've added a lot of new things. You can see the history of the farm. Um, dating back to the 1870s, the road would have gone right through the farm and it had not been for the protection of this property. We've added a bunch of green infrastructure, green roofs, solar panels, wind turbines, and more. Uh, we're selling rain barrels and composters. There's a lot of reasons to come down and see what we've got there. If you're a member, thank you very much. Um, and if you're not, please look into um, joining our programs. So I wanna talk about bringing it local. So we're in Illinois and you've invested in Illinois, you bought your house here, your kids go to school here and thinking about how Doug Pelham's story relates to us personally here. In Illinois, there's 36 million acres, 95% private property. So if we're gonna think we're gonna build our communities better, we have to think about private ownership. We work with schools, municipalities, homeowners associations, pretty much any property can be um, improved. And our primary area is Kane, DuPage, Kendall, and Will counties. We're being pulled into LaSalle and Grundy, and the Conservation at Home program is now operating in um, 22 other counties in Illinois, parts of Wisconsin and Michigan. So we can help you specifically in Illinois and answer those questions that you had. And I know in Doug Tallamy's thing, a lot of those questions came up in there um, asking specific things like um, what kind of tree do I plant in Illinois? And that's the, um, the benefit we bring is being a local land trust. We can help you with those specific questions to Illinois. And also we sell trees. So we have access to those native species of oaks and a variety of other trees, shrubs, and um, herbaceous plants. So besides the stuff that Doug talked about with being the birds and the insects, there's a lot of benefit for us. We have a Nature RX program. This picture on the left is my granddaughter and they found a, a larva of a milkweed on a milkweed plant of a monarch 
and the fascination of her and her mother and how this could possibly happen and how that little caterpillar is going to pupate and turn into an orange butterfly and fly to Mexico and come back. You know, the story is just amazing. And kind of grasping that these benefits that Doug Tallamy talked about are going to be around us. And we have a connection to the earth, whether we really hold it or not is another question. Um, it's a picture of my son and his best friend. We're in the garden clubs. We enjoy our yards. We're going on vacation to these beautiful places. It's all because we have this internal connection to nature. And this is only going to help that by bringing nature a little bit closer to us. One of the things we've had a problem with in our area is turf grass. They talked a little bit about it uh, previously, but when I go out to people's homes, like these um, oak trees here, the worst thing we could have is have grass up to our oak trees. They were never evolved with that type of situation. Grass, turf grass has come from Europe. It's not native here. It has zero wildlife value and it's not good for our trees and shrubs. All this leaf litter that Doug Tallamy talked about how wonderful it is would have to be raked off of these areas because our precious grass. We're pouring tremendous amounts of chemicals on the grass to feed it and take care of it. And that's ending up in our waterways. You'll hear more about that um, when they talk about the water later in this program. But people in general have locked on to turf as this wonderful thing. Doug talked about his son's property. And if we look at what we've filled our yards with, and all you'd have to do is Google a plant to find out if it's connected to Illinois or not. And there's nothing wrong with having a hosta or a daylily, but we have to understand that it's not connected to the environment. Doug talked about the system and that's the ecosystem and the functional approach of connecting with nature. And so these plants are just sitting out there as foreign objects and they're not connected. They're not feeding our wildlife. They're not um, doing the same functional things that we want. And if we want to put a few in our yards for decorative purposes, that's fine. But not, they're not, they can't be the core if we want a functional landscape. So, you know, looking at this hummingbird, they come and scan your property and there's either something there for them or not. They can pretty much look at it and say, no, nothing here, and away they go. So if we're not a, having the hummingbird come to our yard, it's probably because we haven't provided the necessary things that they're looking for. Same thing with those birds. If we don't have the right trees with the right caterpillars, the birds are not gonna be coming to our yard. We've decided what we can put in our yards. The whole landscape, other than the tiny remnant prairies that are left has been changed. And we have the power to change things. And understanding that if you want the change to happen, we have to do it, we have to work at it. And that's where we come in, where we're not leaving you alone and just say, well, good luck, go do it. You know, we will help you through the process. And whether or not you make the whole yard native or just parts of it, there are tricks that we can do it to make it look pretty. I know a lot of people don't wanna trade I don't want a jungle in my yard and I don't have an oak woodland. So what would I do? This is in um, Glen Ellen and they don't have any grass in the front yard. Now this, this don't, I'm not telling you you have to do this, but some people are doing it. And part of the conservation at home is to, you know, look at what the balance that people want to have and try to bring that to people. There's some tricks that we can do that make it look pretty and when we get to the point of somebody saying, well, I wouldn't know where to begin, that's exactly where we step in. We give free yard advice. I will come to your yard. We now have um, five other staff members at the Conservation Foundation that help me. So it isn't me alone, but we understand that handing you a plant brochure is not enough, that you need some personalized help. And um, we have plant sales, we have plant recommendations, where you can go buy the plants. We have contractors that can help you install them. 
Um, we look at water issues and you can join the club, but it isn't required. So we will help you for free. So that's how we go about it. And um, we're now um, looking at 5,000 different properties across the region. The little dots represent people that are applying these conservation at home practices to their properties. Different colors are different organizations that are working across the area. And um, it doesn't matter what county you're in, we can probably help you. And I'm helping people even out of our area with plant um, suggestions and connecting to their local land trust. For non-residential properties, we have a conservation at work program. And this is just a short list of places that we've been working on to bring their landscapes into an eco-friendly position. And again, it's meant to look at whether it's a hospital or gardens, nature centers, uh, water commission, uh, lots of different people are jumping on the bandwagon to bring uh, commercial property into a more eco-friendly setting. So Doug talked about a little bit, but this is the prairie state and these plants have evolved with deep root systems that are different. So uh, this on the far left here, this is turf grass. And you can see it has no root system. And this depiction of a human height, you can see how tall the plants are comparatively speaking and how deep they would go into the ground. So this is the magic. So these plants are engaged, they know, they've evolved knowing that we have harsh winters and um, powerful summers, and we have to um, kind of understand that that evolution has made them more sustainable and more functional in our area. The way to make them look nice is clump them. I teach at COD and do these lectures all the time, keeping them a little shorter and putting in rocks and logs and clumps of plants that make it look uh, uniform. And I get very few people that want me to talk about skunks and snakes. Everybody loves the birds and the butterflies, and they're pretty easy to bring to a landscape. It's like a, uh, a recipe book. So you wouldn't start making a cake without looking at the recipe book. And the same thing, if you wanted to make a landscape that was more suitable for these colorful native birds, even this little wren down here eats uh, its main food source is bugs. So if you're looking at the turf grass versus the native, what one do you think is more colorful? What, where would your eyes be drawn if you were walking down this path? One needs to be mowed every week and even the orange is milkweed for the monarchs. So it's not an argument to me to say that these plants are better for our environment. So the question becomes how do we put them in a way that is going to not cause difficulty or strife in our family or our workplace. And integrating them are gonna give us benefits. So if you sell benefits, this milkweed here, this is the swamp milkweed, and it's planted adjacent to the fruit trees in, the, in our area at the farm. Here we've got native plantings in a rain garden right along the highway where water from the street, which is carrying chemicals, can soak into the planting beds and reduce the amount of flooding that would cause uh, from water coming off the road. So solving problems, I went to this yard and they showed me this area here that this is where the flooding is. And I said, well, it's not now. So understanding that these conditions are variable in the springtime, it's way different, but understanding that this is heavy clay in Illinois, we have problems with clay and compost could be one of the answers. What do you do with all those leaves? You compost them, improve the soil, and then change the plantings. So with the water issues, we can come out too and look where the water's moving across the yard. We have rain barrels. We have information on how to build a rain garden, bioswales, and we have three different types of water harvesting at the farm that you can see. The problem we're having with trees here, specifically in Illinois, is we have too many maples and honey locusts. We need more oaks, but that's not all, just tree diversity. We have invasive species that we're dealing with. We have the grass problem and we have a lot of damage. So the trees are not lasting like they should easily in Illinois. 
I mean, oaks should be two or 300 years and we're not getting that life and we're not getting the regeneration. So we can help you with those things and understanding that those areas under the trees where we're having difficulty growing shade plants anyway, or grass won't grow, that it can be very beautiful with the native planting. So it isn't a problem to have open area under a tree. And if we want to have our yards, this yard has clearly been treated for a play area for the kids, but that's okay. We're going to buffer that with native plantings out here, create that area where we have habitat and we're absorbing that water as it comes off the property. So in all of these instances, we're seeing ways that we can make our yards better and we can attract wildlife that we're going to enjoy and we can hear those bugs and birds and enjoy the sounds and smells of nature closer to us. We don't always have time to go to the forest preserve or the Morton Arboretum. So incorporating that into our lives and connecting better with nature is gonna make us healthier and our yards more sustainable. So I've outlined how the best I could do to bring it past just handing you a thing and saying you should do something better is I will walk you through it and personally come out if needed. Great, thank you, Jim, so much. Um, yeah, I'll, we'll, I'll post Jim's email also in the chat later, and then you can contact Jim directly. Um, there you go, there's his information, Jay Kleinwachter at the conservationfoundation.org. And uh, there's our phone number, but I can post that uh, information later on in the website or on our chat, and then um, I'll do it as soon as we're done here. And with that, there's a five minute break now. We will reconvene at 11.05. And I'm going to put on a short video about a woodland restoration that one of our Conservation at Home members did. So I'm going to share. Uh, oh, OK, yes. I'm going to stop you sharing your screen, Jim. So <laughs> we'll go on to this now. Let's see. Come on. I'm trying to get the video. Why is this not going? I'm sorry. <clears throat> sorry, I, I meant. Uh, yeah, we're going to go on at uh, Lindsay is on after Jim at 10. I'm sorry, the break is 1015 to 1020. And then Lindsay will be coming on at 1120. Sorry, I looked at my wrong uh, schedule here. And for some no, reason, I... no, not not 1120. I'll be going on at 1020, right? I'm sorry. Yes, 1020. I'm sorry. Okay. 1020. I'm looking at this wrong. 10, 1015 to 1020. And Lindsay's on from 1020 to 11. Sounds good. Thank you. And I'm trying to get this video started and it's not wanting to go for me. Here we go. Let me get. If not, I mean, if there's time, we can, I can answer questions now or you can, they can have them email me. Actually, I've got to get back up. Yeah. It, yeah. You can email Jim too. This video. Okay. I'll go back to basic. Share. Uh, there we go. Got it now. There's a certain grandeur to the oaks that is irreplaceable. In ours, we have a lot of them that are about 150 years old. I love to just walk through here and, and look at the plants and, and kind of marvel. The very early spring is remarkable with all the wood anemones and the um, polyctum and the different kinds of trilliums. I think every day I just walk through the property and enjoy it. We bought this house about 22 years ago. We had to work on the inside of the house because the wiring was bad, but finally we started looking outside. And bo But both of us were working, so we didn't have a lot of time and we didn't know anything. The first thing we did is cleared some spaces out front and we went out and bought $300 worth of pasta because the gardens that I knew were like most of us, you know, had in the past, the manicured lawn and then the little clusters. And that's what we thought we'd have here. <laughs> so we planted the pasta and next morning we got up and there were just a little row of nubbins where the deer had found them. Ah, that was the beginning of our education. The place was covered with buckthorn and garlic mustard. 
uh, poison ivy was like, some of it was actual bushes. Finally, we started clearing out the bad stuff. And to our great surprise, all the good stuff started popping up. There's a seed bank and there they are. Like we have so many white trillium and those are considered, hmm, I don't know if they're considered rare, but uncommon. And they just started popping up all over. So in the back, we have a multitude of little trees that are beginning to grow now that we've given them light. And wildflowers, there's just wildflowers we never heard of. Like Jim Kleinwachter was out here the other day from the Conservation Foundation. And he started showing us some of the things we didn't know we had. Like we have a, a yellow trillium, which I'd never heard of. They actually mostly grow in the south. But to our way of thinking, there's nothing wrong with combining the cultivated and the natural. It it's really gives a nice effect, we think. And we started putting out feeders and we learned that different birds eat different food um, and that they like water, particularly running water. And then we got a heated bird bath in the winter. And we've had this amazing Eventually, it's, as I said, build it and they will come, and we've just had all these fabulous birds. We still don't know a great deal, but we like what we've kind of created. It's like we call it our little park. I like to just walk through it, you know, and look at it all. And it's something, I guess it's, I hadn't thought about it until the other day, brought us closer together. It's something we share because we both love it, and Tim has been amazing. He's the one who dug up all the, the buckthorn and went out there with Maddox, and he is the expert bird feeder. I think at our age, it's a two-man job, but we don't really bring in much help because they don't understand that a property like this. If you bring in a company, they just want to spread weed killer and mow everything down. So it's our, it's our project. We want some of these things for ourselves, but I guess it's, um, we're trying to preserve a lot of things for the next generation. A number of people do like wildflowers that we know you begin to associate with your own kind, you know. Julie Long's coming over tomorrow to get shooting stars because we have so many of them. There's that old adage that if you give away plants and flowers, some of the fragrance remains upon your hands. I like that. <laughs> And I, I love to give them away. You know. So we've got a whole bunch of pots we're about to fill right now for other people. Sorry, that went a little longer than I thought, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lindsay. Lindsay is with the a Conservation Director with the Illinois Environmental Council, uh, the 30 by 30 plan in Illinois, Actions to Fight Climate Change. So with that, um, I'm going to turn that over to uh, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, and then can you see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Great. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. I'm Lindsay Keeney. I'm the Conservation Director at the Illinois Environmental Council. Uh, we work with the Conservation Foundation and just uh, a ton of environmental organizations within Illinois, as well as we do a little bit of federal work and a lot of local, like county-based uh, work within Chicago uh, in the city. And then all the way through Illinois downstate. I'm located in central Illinois, right outside of Springfield in a little town called Ashland. I work out of our Springfield office during uh, normal times. Right now I'm working from my home office in Ashland. And IEC, if you've never heard of us, are we like to call ourselves like the, the trade organization for the environment, for the plants and the trees and the animals. Uh, there's a lot of lobbying organizations for, you know, big ag and for like all of these other industries have lobbying organizations. And when IEC was established, it was to fill the need that 
the small environmental nonprofits, the land trusts, um, you know, the small good guys didn't really have someone at the state capitol uh, standing up for them and, and speaking for them. So a lot of IEC's work is advocacy. Um, and then the other space that we do a lot of work in is coalition building and organizing. Uh, so we do a lot of work at the state house. We do a ton of work that's bigger than just conservation. Uh, we have staff that do clean energy and recycling and uh, all of these other pieces of sustainability. But um, I will, I say this all the time in a light teasing manner, but I have the best job at IEC because I get to work with the conservation folks and the farmers. Um, and I, I think that's the most fun work. I would be lost in the clean energy landscape um, or in some of those other landscapes. So uh, I really enjoy the work that I get to do for IEC. And a big part of that this year has been working on this uh, 30 by 30 plan and like figuring out what that is. Um, another small plug, and I'll plug it again here at the end, is we, another big part of my job is legislative tours. And so we take legislators and decision makers and we get them out of their office and out to conservation properties. So I'll plug that again at the end. If anyone has really cool properties they want to show off to legislators and sort of make the case for why conservation is important, um, I am working to set a bunch of those up this year. Uh, so a big part of my job this year is working on 30 by 30, like figuring out what it is, what is this thing. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you folks are with it. I know that we've got members of the general public on here and also some conservation professionals. So some of you may be uh, pretty sick of hearing 30 by 30 and some of you may be uh, in the boat where you're just like have heard whispers or are a little bit confused about it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit high level and then I will drill down into like what's going on here in Illinois. So what the heck is this 30 by 30 thing? There's a lot to unpack here. Um, you know, you've heard words like nature-based solutions and this 30% of land and water by 2030 on the way to 50 by 50. Uh, you've heard that I hear a lot about the half earth theory, this global deal for nature. There's sort of all these buzzwords out there. Uh, America the beautiful refers to the plan that the US picked. Is it a campaign, an agreement, a pledge? Like what? What is this thing, these buzzwords, what does it actually mean? Um, so there's a few different scales that we're gonna talk about the plan at, or like the way this initiative, this movement is going on. So there's a, a global effort, which inspired the work that the United States is doing sort of federally with the Biden administration and the America the Beautiful plan. Uh, and then we will unpack how Illinois can contribute to that. Um, so there's, uh, Doug sort of cued this up, couldn't have been more perfect for me. He talked about how there are two major crises happening uh, on a global scale right now, and that is cl climate, the climate catastrophe and the biodiversity crisis. Uh, and so in January of 2021, there was this group, a meeting of scientists from around the world, and they issued this warning that is, it, the quote was humanity is causing a rapid loss of biodiversity and with it Earth's ability to support complex life. Um, and a big piece of that was this is separate and different from the climate emergency. Uh, this is not just saving nature for nature's sake. The report made really clear the links between biodiversity and nature and things like food security, clean water uh, in both rich and poor countries, but especially affecting the countries that are least contributing to the problem. Uh, this meeting and the things that came out of it alongside other research, including the landmark, the 2019 IPBES report, which I'll throw the link in there here at the end for that. Uh, it reinforced the urgency for the, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity to approve an ambitious strategy to curb global biodiversity loss. And that was, talked about as the 30 by 30 plan. They also made it really clear that the Paris Climate Agreement, which is imperative to curb greenhouse gas emissions, will do very little by itself to save the planet's collapsing biodiversity or preserve the massive ecosystems upon which all of humanity depends and which we as a species are fast degrading. 
Um, so that sounds a little stark and I'm just gonna sort of keep hitting you with the starkness of this, uh, but there are gonna be some, some things that we can do about it here coming up. So at a United States level at that scale, um, we are losing, we've lost 24 million acres of natural area since 2001. That's about a football field every 30 seconds. Uh, only 12% of US land is protected, which is a pretty big chunk. Half of that though is in Alaska. Uh, it, if you look at the map here, you see how much uh, more protected land there is in the West. Um, that's sort of a duh thing. Like there, that's where all the national parks, you know, the, the uh, BLM land is. Um, so we have a little bit of a different story here in the Midwest. This is where food is grown. This is where, uh, you know, commodity crops are grown. Our land works for us in different ways. Um, so three, so then back to the global scale, about three quarters of all land on earth and three quarters of all water has been altered by humans. Um, then just another fact is in the US, now the average distance from wild places is less than a half a mile um, from where people live to the nearest wild space. So in response to that, we, we had this global response this call to save nature. Uh, and then in the US, the idea was picking up steam uh, sort of at the same time, sort of about three years later. Um, Senator Udall passed a resolution under Trump, uh, which was to start and form the 30 by 30 plan. Um, the Land and Water Conservation Fund legislation was, was passed. So this steam was sort of picking up here in the United States. And then based on a national effort, effort by all these diverse organizations, the League of Conservation Voters, um, I'm sure state-based organizations were involved. IEC did a little bit of work on it. Um, probably a lot of the local land trust and conservation organizations that you guys uh, work with or donate to were involved to uh, lobby the candidates who were running for president to take on this, this 30 by 30 initiative and this Save Nature initiative. Um, so President Biden campaigned on the idea of 30 by 30 and immediately after his election, he published the America the Beautiful plan. Immediately, it was a, a year later, but it was, it was, it came out after his election. Um, so there, a lot of us have thoughts on the plan that the Biden administration put forward. Uh, some of the same issues that we face as a state are what the nation is grappling with. There's these diverse array of problems and solutions, and it makes it really hard to capture in a single document how the nation is going to tackle this mission to save nature. Uh, at the Illinois scale, we are thinking of the exact same problems. Uh, Illinois is so varied, like urban versus rural, um, different ecosystems, just, just tackling some of the same things. So they came up with uh, their tagline, locally led to conserve and restore lands and waters and what, of which we all depend. Uh, they address three threats, land threats to land, threats to water and threats to wildlife. Um, and then they had three themes, which was abundance, safeguard drinking water, clean air, food supplies and wildlife, resilience, fight climate change with natural solutions and accessibility, which was to give every child in America the chance to experience the wonders of nature. Um, so this plan came out and they had these places that they wanted to put our first focus, our nation's first effort on, and they came up with these goals and I'll, I'll just read the goals to you. We have adopted them in Illinois. It's create more parks and safe outdoor opportunities in nature deprived communities, support tribally led conservation priorities, expand collaborative conservation of fish and wildlife habitats and corridors increase equitable, well-managed, sustainable access for outdoor recreation, incentivize and reward voluntary conservation efforts of fishers, farmers, ranchers, and forest owners, 
And the last pillar was to create jobs by investing in restoration and resilience. Uh, and then they had a listening session. They've done some nationwide listening sessions on the America the Beautiful plan, as well as on the tool that they're hoping to use to track. The tool has, is sort of just at a concept stage, uh, but they imagine having this tool that will track the nation's open space and protected acreage. Um, we made some public comments as IEC uh, and as a coalition about Illinois' unique uh, agricultural presence and how we can incorporate sustainable agriculture into uh, counting towards these goals. So that is what's going on at the national scale federally with the Biden administration. Where does that leave Illinois, right? We don't have, we have a national forest in Southern Illinois, but we don't have a lot of national parks. We don't have any national parks. Uh, we have a lot of working lands, a lot of agriculture, we have state parks. Uh, so what, what's Illinois doing? What does this mean for our state? Um, this picture is a borrowed slide. And I always, whenever I get to this one, I, I think about how varied Illinois is because this is the picture of Illinois from uh, Northern Illinois. And then my version of what I think is very more rurally focused very much more rural, um, a lot more farm and agriculture. So we've got a big challenge here in mel melding these two ideas together and um, taking some leads from the national campaign and really figuring out how we can contribute as our unique state, as our unique group of stakeholders, um, how we maintain equity between Northern Illinois and Chicago and urban environments. Uh, Southern Illinois Central, and just how, how we put all these pieces together. Um, so it's, it's hard to communicate to legislators and the public that Illinois is an agriculture state, but we have a plethora of ecosystems that are ripe for conservation and restoration efforts. Uh, I know Jim talked right before me just about the importance of private land ownership and how, we, how, how do we weave that into the puzzle as well. So I know I'm throwing a ton of questions at you guys and not a whole lot of answers, uh, but I'll, I'll get to our coalition and how we're sort of working through those answers here in a minute. Um, and this is, you know, due to the lack of protected lands in Illinois and the exacerbating climate change, every single Illinois resident has experienced the impacts of climate and biodiversity loss. We, every single one of us deals with flooding there were agricultural disasters in all 102 counties last year, or in the last five years. Uh, we see shoreline erosion and the disruption of our food systems, especially during the pandemic, we've seen that disruption of our food systems. So here are the, you're looking at the slide that have, you know, the fast facts for the state of conservation in Illinois, where are we at? We have less than 4% of land protected. Um, and that is the, the traditional definition of protection. It's in long term, and it's probably closer to like 3.8, 3.9, it's rounded to four. Um, and that's the traditional definition of long term protections. It's owned by an organization that is committing to protect it into the future. 75%. So first of all, 4%, that's very small compared to this 30% that, you know, scientists think will help us uh, stave off this biodiversity collapse and, and climate change. Um, we are at 4%. So the national goal is 30. A lot of states are trying to work on getting to that 30% for themselves, but does that make sense for Illinois? I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Um, getting to 30% for Illinois would look like about 10.9 million acres. Uh, to get to 5% in Illinois, maybe this will, when I talk about millions of acres, it's really hard to conceptualize that. Uh, so this might help to get to just 5%, we would need 420,000 acres, which would be the size of the Shawnee National Forest, plus two Medewins. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Medewins or Medewin, the TNC property, 
but it would be those the Shawnee plus two Manu. And so that is that's huge. That would be more land than Illinois has conserved in decades. Um, so 75% of the Illinois land is in agriculture. Uh, and with that stark number, we only grow 4% of the food consumed in our state, despite we us having the most fertile soil in the nation. Um, that's one of my, it's a sad fact, but it's one of my favorite ones because we like, you know, we like to say that we were the breadbasket. We grow the food for the nation and, and we are shipping a lot of that food out, but we're really not feeding the people of our state. Um, that I know Tanisha on our staff, when we were doing our listening sessions, I had said, you know, is it worth asking folks if they're aware that you can't eat corn and soybeans? Like the, the fields and the food that we see growing out our windows on the interstate, like that is in, not edible. Um, and she was shocked to learn that. And we have done that at listening sessions. And and there's a lot of folks that aren't aware that, you know, we're, we're going to feed cattle, we're going to make plastics. Um, the the large majority of the commodity crops that we see out the windows aren't going to feed Illinois residents. Uh, and then this last fact is that we rank 44th in public land ownership. Whenever I get on the calls with all the states that are working on this, uh, I'm always, you know, not ashamed, but like, oh, I wish we, I, I would like to brag about climbing that, that list. I would like more access to uh, public land for, for the citizens of Illinois. Um, oh, I don't think I was ready for that one yet. Um, so with that over 23 million acres of cropland, this is a really big opportunity to offer uh, opportunities for regenerative practices and ways to make those farm acres count for us and capture carbon and provide habitat uh, and sort of contribute to this this effort. And so maybe there will be different levels of protection, but uh, a regenerative field is certainly higher than a, you know, traditionally tilled commodity crop planted field. Um, and so we're really fleshing out what, what does that look like? And then the last pillar, especially for Illinois, is that maintenance and green jobs are vital to keep what we protect. Uh, I'll, if you're familiar with conservation in Illinois, you know that there had, had long been a model of land trust purchasing uh, conservation properties, the state taking over the ownership and the stewardship of those and how that model has sort of uh, crumbled in the last 20 years. And the pivots that the conservation community is taking to, to think up new models and how we also steward all of this land uh, that land trusts are, have worked to protect and now need to steward into perpetuity. So uh, this next slide, before I start talking about the 30 by 30 coalition that is working to answer all of these questions I've uh, thrown at you all, I want this graphic on here is one of my favorite graphics. I put it on almost every like slideshow and presentation I do. Um, it's from DNR and it is the Illinois Natural Divisions. And there are 14 there's 14 of them and that's the same so natural divisions those are different habitats different uh natural uh landscapes and so we go all the way from the driftless down to the shawnee um look look this up on dnr's website because we have the coolest state you guys we have as many natural divisions as california we're tied with the top amount of natural divisions um so we have a lot of unique areas in Illinois, a lot of unique, really cool, really neat places. Uh, we take legislators out to, you know, all the, the beautiful places, Medewin, Garden of the Gods, Sigmund River, Emaquan, and we hear all the time, oh my gosh, it doesn't feel like I'm in Illinois. And we've got to get to the point where we, we are proud of Illinois the same way as some of the other states are proud of their natural landscapes. And so I always plug this because Illinois is such a cool, long state, just like California. We have just as many natural divisions. Um, and it's a unique place to make a big difference in conservation. So 
what is this coalition after I get off my soapbox about Illinois being a cool state? Um, we had all these same questions. The conservation community had all these questions. How does Illinois fit into the puzzle? How do we contribute to the campaign if we're not going to protect 30% of Illinois? Uh, how do we use this campaign as a mechanism to reinvigorate conservation in Illinois? It's sort of taken a back seat with the budget crises over the last few years. Um, any of you that follow state policy and state budget advocacy know that you know, DNR conservation uh, grant programs are, are on the chopping block there. Uh, you know, it's hard to make an argument against, you know, medical care and public services. Uh, it's not hard. I, I have good arguments, but it, it's the reality that we see a lot of times. So we created this created, we invited all the folks that were already having these conversations. Uh, to join us in a coalition to think about how our state tackles this problem. We modeled it after the Clean Jobs Coalition, which Illinois Environmental Council, along with other partners, uh, had led to work through the CJA, the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, and so in the same vein as the Clean Jobs Coalition, we invited a lot of stakeholders, we are still in the process of inviting cross-sector stakeholders. These include things like environmental advocates, land trusts, land stewards, community-based organizations, folks from the agriculture community, uh, sportsmen, hunters, fishermen, and we wanna work with you know, everyone at the table to collaborate on a shared goal of supporting biodiversity and mitigating climate change and do that in a way that is community-based and in an equitable manner. Uh, the last thing that we wanna do is go into communities and say, oh, this is what you should do. Like, let's, let's protect this. We wanna hear from each community about what 30 by 30 looks like for them and uh, let them build that from the ground up. So that's the 30 by 30 coalition. How are we going to do this? Uh, we're looking at how we put this puzzle together. What commitments has our state already made. Um, hang on, I'm just flipping back over here to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, what com commitments has our state already made? We've got the Illinois Wildlife Action Plan, the Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, the Soil Health Strategy. Our state is really good at making plans that go into the future. That's like the 10-year uh, nutrient loss plan or the Wildlife Action Plan, and then sort of printing that into a binder and putting it on a shelf uh, and maybe doing the, the check-ins that we set forth in statute to say that we would do. Um, but there's all, all of this groundwork has been done by uh, really great experts in their field worked on the Illinois Wildlife Action Plan. And so we want to make sure that this previous work, this groundwork is informing the process and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel and start over and say, oh, how do we, how do we protect 30% of Illinois without acknowledging uh, the work that has been done to move these individual pieces forward. We envision, uh, and this is the, the IEC part coming out on us, we envision an advocacy in a policy package. Uh, we had originally envisioned it in 2022, and that's just not going to happen with the shortened session. Um, and we're really still uh, taking it slowly, getting into communities and figuring out what this will look like. So it, it will more likely be a 2023, 2024 priority, um, some sort of policy package that funds conservation and outlines what our 30 by 30 commitments and goals are. Uh, funding is gonna be a giant piece of this, right? Like how do we, if the state's gonna make a commitment, how do we, how do we pay for it? How do we make sure that these pieces have stewards to take care of them? Um, these properties. So the second sort of pillar is aligning the conservation community. Uh, any of you folks that work within the conservation community, I, I run into this a lot because I do our ag work and our conservation work. And I'll go to all these meetings and there's a little group working on uh, soil health here and here and here and, and not a lot of uh, getting everyone together to work through those ideas. Uh, and there's a couple coalitions doing that work, the Sustainable Ag Partnership, the uh, 
Prairie State Conservation Coalition, sort of statewide coalitions that are doing that work. So we want to interface with them and uh, sort of align everybody on all of these uh, coals in the fire and combine our power and leverage that when we go to the state house and say, all right, this is what the conservation community has decided and wants to do. Um, we also want to reevaluate. I talked about all that groundwork that had been laid throughout our commitments and plans and strategies that the state has put forth. Uh, some of those are 10 years old. We plan to reevaluate them with an equity lens and with the input of the affected communities to think through which commitments and goals need uh, revised based on uh, that reevaluation. And then the other big pillar is that we want community level feedback. So we've already started these listening sessions throughout Illinois. Uh, we've done maybe five or six. Uh, I am horrendously disappointed to have to do them virtually because uh, when we did this for CJ, it was so fun to go into communities and hear the individual uh, ideas and barriers and struggles that communities were having and how they were thinking about it. Uh, and I think virtual will be just as effective. Um, it's just less fun for me because I don't get to see the state and go do, th do things. But so we've already done about five or six of these. We've got more planned. Um, and those are sort of geographically based listening sessions in neighborhoods and communities throughout the state. We also have these focus groups planned. Um, we want to gather the land trust and hear what they have to say about it. We want to gather the hunters and fishermen and hear what they have to say about it. Uh, just different focus groups of people and how they're thinking about 30 by 30. And another big piece of this is, you know, the way I was talking about it and we were thinking about it was that with the America the Beautiful plan, there's likely going to be federal resources and federal funding coming down that Illinois will have to be on the same page about how to spend and how to allocate. Um, the way that the last few bills have gone and are currently going through federal policy right now, I'm not super uh, uh, positive that we're there's going to be funding tied to this. I think there eventually will, but I've, I've started thinking more how we can do it on the state level. Um, so we're also doing those focus groups and then we're having some issue specific conversations. So uh, what do we think about jobs? How do we uh, build jobs and new employment and job training into these goals? Uh, what are the equity aspects of everything? What uh, like open space? What, what are the issues just around open space, parks, um, access to those spaces. Uh, so yeah, we, it like wetlands, we've had a, a lot of rivers conversations uh, here in Illinois. So we're, we're, we're at that like talking stage where we're just gathering information and data and opinions and what folks think and what experts think and what communities think. Um, so our outcomes are that we hope to ensure that Illinois can take full advantage of any federal funding opportunities that come out of the national commitment uh, by aligning state and federal programs. Uh, that will take the form of any America the Beautiful, beautiful federal legislation, aligning with programs that are already uh, conceptualized, like the, the CREP program, the working on the farm bill and making sure that Illinois is poised to utilize uh, any opportunities and we're not leaving money on the table. That is a, a traditional thing that Illinois has done in our state throughout the budget impasses is not take advantage of federal funding opportunities and, and leaving millions of dollars on the table that would fund programs and our agencies. Uh, so we were hoping for a comprehensive policy package in 2022. This is a, a outdated slide because in 2022 between COVID and the election cycle, the session in the state house is likely going to be over by May. Um, so we're really looking at this as a planning and gathering information year, coalition building, uh, really thinking through our strategy. And then we're hoping to develop that policy package for 2023. 
Uh, we want collaborative and strategic local conservation efforts. And the thing I'm always uh, sort of pounding on is that Illinois should become a leader in conservation. There's such an opportunity here. Um, so this is just a quick graphic about how we think about addressing this biodiversity crisis. Uh, less biodiversity on the bottom, greater at the top. And what I like about this is it shows a model for stacking all of this work. It's not climate change action or addressing the biodiversity crisis or working on polluters uh, or working on sustainable agriculture and incentivizing. It's all of these things are going to build to reverse that uh, biodiversity loss. So it's it's stacking all of these efforts up uh, to capitalize and maximize the amount that we can uh, stop the biodiversity crisis. Um, so this next slide are, I walked through the America the Beautiful pillars and goals, and those are, they're pretty general. They are supposed to apply to the nation. So the coalition developed these pieces. Um, the coalition is in its infancy. We're asking all of these questions, thinking about how our state can contribute. Um, so in addition to the eight priorities laid out in America the Beautiful, we also identified that we want to work on outdoor access, clean water, local food systems, uh, public process within communities so that communities are resourced and empowered to make their own decisions, uh, working on sustainable ag and jobs. So those are the Illinois specific pieces of the plan that is still in development. Um, how can you help? How can you contribute to this process? So as an individual citizen, you can participate in a listening session. They'll be coming to plenty of communities. They're virtual. Um, if you're interested in that, my email is on the next slide uh, and I'll just shoot me an email. I can connect you with the one that, that is on the calendar that you fit into. Um, if you're a conservation organization, you can host a listening session uh, for your community, for the focus group, uh, like if you're Audubon, you might want to find out what people who care about bird conservation want to make sure it gets into the 30 by 30 plan. Um, you can share our action alerts. Even though we don't have a comprehensive package in 2023 or in 2022, if you get into our, uh, onto our email list, we are going to have quite a few conservation bills this year in 2022. So you can fill out an action alert, tell your legislators, hey, I care about this. Um, ask your legislators to co-sponsor our bills. Um, but even if you just share that action alert on social media, um, being able to tell a legislator, hey, you know, thousands of people in your district have, have filled this out and say this is an issue they care about is really effective. Um, and then you are more than welcome to just shoot me an email to reach out with any feedback or ideas you have for how Illinois tackles 30 by 30. Um, if you are a conservation organization or someone who wants to get involved, you are more than welcome to join the coalition and call into those monthly calls. Um, and then we have different issue conversations all the time. So um, you can get on our listserv and sort of stay aware of that work and, and chime in as it pertains to you. But here is my email. Um, and then I think I'll turn it over to questions. I see the Q and A's. So if you want, Lindsay, uh, Jamie and I will, are tag team and ans ask you the question so you don't have to scroll through them all. Perfect. And I will post uh, Lindsay's, uh, Lindsay's email in the chat so that everyone has it. So um, I'll, I'll go first, Jamie, and a uh, question from Peggy, if you know Peggy. Uh, what is a definition of, na of natural area and a, healthy, and a healthy environment land without structure? Is it, is it a healthy environment, natural environment without structures? What is a definition? Sure. And Jamie, are you just marking that that we're answering it live now? Is that why it says that? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't have a definition of natural area. That's something that the policy pieces that we write might answer. Uh, it might be uh, 
a service to us to define a natural area? It might not. Um, it, it might vary community to community. Um, there are GAP, uh, oh, and I don't even know what GAP stands for. GAP is the like level of protections and I'm sure someone in these 440 experts on this call under, knows that. Um, but there's, there's definitions of different levels of protection. Um, and we're really wrestling with, do we want to make a commitment uh, of a certain amount of acres to a certain level of protection? Um, or do we want to go about it a different way? So I'm sorry I didn't answer that exactly well, but there's there's no uh, standard definition for now. Yeah. Okay, great. Jamie? All right. Before we get to the next question, I, I just want to thank Lindsay. Um, we Lindsay also did a webinar with us. Some of you may know I am the host for the Conservation Foundation's uh, Conservation Online Webinar Series every month. And Lindsay mm -hmm. did a webinar with us. That's all of our webinars are saved and stored on our YouTube channel. So you can check out the Conservation Foundation's YouTube channel for all the past recordings of the monthly webinars that we do, used to be weekly. Um, so we have a ton of webinars there, um, but also a recording of this presentation or uh, this actually the entire conference will be posted on our YouTube channel later today. So for those of you asking if you're gonna get a link to it, yes, you will. Um, and if somehow you miss it, just go to our YouTube channel, you'll find it there. All right, back to questions. Pat wants to know, is this plan inclusive of wetlands? Um, she's concerned about the reduced um, restrictions that are being implemented now. Yes, um, we have a group of folks within our coalition that are really tackling it from the uh, perspective of wetlands. Um, the wetlands initiatives on there, American Rivers, um, and I, I'm just thinking about the organizations. There's, there's lots of uh, folks doing that work. Great. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, um, uh, they're asking about how is IDOT contributing with right-of-way plantings? I don't have a good answer for this one. I'm not sure. I'm not up to date on what's going on with right-of-way plantings. And actually, I can answer, may be able to help with that answer, yeah. is uh, Jim Kleinwalker is working with a group, and they are addressing uh, the right-of-ways of road right-of-ways, also the uh, utility line easements that go through the county. They're talking about doing some native plantings under them to reduce the uh, amount of mowing on that. So, Jamie, you want to take the next one? Or did I take one? Who did you just, I'm getting confused. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, Rachel would like to know, do you think voluntary efforts are enough to reduce nutrient loss on the part of agriculture? No. Um, personally, I don't. I, we continue to see uh, nutrient loss reduction strategy numbers not meeting uh, our, our goals. Um, do I think that it needs to be mandated? I don't, I don't think so. We've seen a lot of fantastic response to an incentive programs. We worked really hard this year on the fall covers for spring savings program, which is a $5 um, credit on your crop insurance bill uh, if you implement cover crops and that's per acre. Um, it's been a really cool program because not only does it give them that financial incentive, it also shows that to a crop insurer, a crop insurer, it's reducing liability. It's making your crop safer when you implement uh, climate smart agriculture practices like cover crops. Uh, another really cool effort that I'll plug uh, for DNR because sometimes I can be a little hard on them, but they're doing some really neat agriculture land lease work. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources is the largest ag land leaser in Illinois, which is wild. They own the most land that they cash rent out to leaseholders. Um, and that has been the way that they've funded state parks historically for, for decades. It's, it's really important to the funding of state parks. And they've recently started implementing all these really cool climate smart agriculture practices, cover crops. Um, they are restricting dicamba and some, some pesticides that aren't good for habitat. They're really saying we're gonna put our money where our mouth is. 
we are going to train the farmers, we are going to incentivize these practices, require them in our leases. Um, and the coolest, it, because they're DNR, right? They should be leading in how we do a uh, really well-managed ag lease. Uh, and the coolest piece of that for me is that if you just living in rural Ashland, we have Jim Edgar State Park is, you know, right behind me, just south. Um, if you are a local farmer and you're required to learn uh, cover cropping or in any practice on the, the land that you farm for the state and you sort of get through those, this is too hard, it's too expensive, the, the pieces that are that are hard to learn in a way that is uh, sort of made safe for you by the state. Like it's it's in the lease, they're providing the funding and the training for some of the practices. Uh, it's a lot easier to say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna incorporate the practices on my own land because most farmers have their own fields as well. Um, and it's one of the best ways to tackle, right? All of the farmland around a state park is in that, uh, is, is filtering the water that's going into the state park. Like we're just cleaning up our public land and our public spaces that uh, our groundwater flows through and our, our service water as well. So I think DNR is doing a fantastic job at that. Um, and I'm happy to plug their work there. Great. So with that, we're out of time. Um, I know some of you still had questions that you wanted to ask and you have Lindsay's uh, email there. Perhaps you can just uh, contact her directly or if Lindsay has time to get to the questions that are in the chat, um, we'll get to that. And with that, I wanna turn it over to Cliff and speaking of farms, when she was talking about, he has uh, the all grass farm and Cliff is about how can regenerative agriculture, agriculture help build climate resiliency? I'm gonna turn it over to Cliff. All right. Thanks, Jan. Let me get the sure. video started here, or the slides. Perfect. All right, share screen. Hopefully my slides will work out. Okay, can you see? We can see your slides, yeah. All right, there we go, perfect. you're good. Thank you. Well, following up on what Linda was uh, talking about, I will touch on a few of those uh, topics as well in my presentation. I think she's uh, stolen a little bit of my thunder, but that's fine. Um, so uh, my name is Cliff McCann, but we have a farm, actually two farms now, but our main farm is in Dundee, Illinois, um, just uh, north of Elgin off of I-90. And uh, we raise a lot of animals on pasture. I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but before we talk about regenerative farming, I know this is a term that's been used widely in the last 10 years. In fact, when we started farming back in 2012, I'd never heard it. We thought we were doing sustainable farming, but it's kind of morphed into regenerative farming, which makes a lot of sense because really what we've, we can't really sustain what we don't have anymore. So we've got to kind of rebuild our soils and our waterways and, uh, you know, our local agricultural sector as well. Um, so I thought I would start out with the definition of regenerative ag. Um, it's really a, uh, conservation and rehabilitation approach to food and farming systems. Uh, it focuses on topsoil regeneration, increasing biodiversity, which you've heard a lot about today, improving the water cycle, enhancing ecosystem services, uh, supporting bio sequestration. We'll talk about that a bit, sequestering carbon and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, uh, increasing resilience to climate change and strengthening the health and vitality of the soil. Uh, in the livestock system, which is really what we use, um, they're rotated through pastures using management techniques that both feed the animals and improve soil health and productivity, again, while sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. And then I'll touch on this a bit more in detail, but you know, how does regenerative ag differ from conventional ag? Uh, conventional agriculture as practiced in the Midwest, where most of you guys are from, is primarily a yield maximization approach. It relies heavily on annual crops, soybeans, corn. Um, most farmers are still tilling their soil annually, if not more than once, which means that they're sticking a plow in it and turning it over. Uh, it's a heavy reliance on synthetic fertilizers, in particular anhydrous ammonia, um, to grow crops and the use of chemical herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides to control weeds and damaging insects. 
And then, of course, you rarely see livestock outdoors anymore. Mostly they're confined in the buildings and the feed is trucked in. Animal waste is hauled out or it's stored on on-site lagoons. Um, so a uh, quick note about um, greenhouse gases. I actually was just at a farming conference last week and uh, heard Jason Roundtree at Michigan State University talk, and he's really focused on uh, animal uh, agriculture and how to minimize uh, the impact. So he estimates that agriculture, and this is just the farming part of it, not the food production side of uh, food systems. Uh, agriculture activities contribute approximately 9.1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And of that 9.1%, uh, so about a third or 3.4% comes from animal agriculture. Uh, but that's really just the beginning of how our conventional systems really are destroying the environment. Um, down in the tropics, you have a lot of deforestation to plant uh, palm palms, uh, so that's very destructive. Uh, annual tillage, which is heavy in the United States, uh, heavy use of obviously pesticides and fertilizers contribute to soil erosion along with the tillage, a lot of nitrogen runoff, uh, water and carbon cycle disruption, and of course, as talked about earlier, the loss of natural habitats for the native insects, birds, pollinators, and other species. So really this green revolution that uh, was hailed probably in the early 70s, late 60s, uh, with our conventional farming techniques has really been an ecological disaster for the, for the globe. Um, so what does regenerative ag really look like? Uh, if you're talking about a livestock system like us, it really involves rotational grazing, uh, ideally on perennial pastures, meaning they're not planted every year, there's no tillage, um, they're planted once and then they regenerate every year. And as, as uh, Doug mentioned earlier, that's one of the best ways to sequester carbon and build healthy soils and organic matter. If you think about what uh, the bison did for the Great Plains um, over millions of years, they were pretty much rotationally grazing. They would move on. Uh, they would take the the, uh, pat, the prairies down to very low levels. They would regenerate. They would come back and eat them again. And that's how you ended up with uh, seven feet of topsoil and, and the Great Plains in some areas, uh, most of which we have plowed away. Um, poultry on pastures, they add a lot of fertility. I'll show you a slide on that. Um, No-till or minimum tillage. Uh, seeds can be planted now with a no-till drill. Tillage is really the worst thing you can do to soil. And I, it just, I cringe every time I drive by and see somebody with a plow on the ground and turn over the soil because that destroys the biological activity of the soil and at the same time releases carbon that's stored in the soil back into the atmosphere. Ideally, and Lindsay talked about this, cover crops, you wanna have roots in that soil year round. Um, so smart farmers are actually planting cover crops in the fall or even late summer into their existing crop of corn or soybeans. Uh, really, you don't want to have any bare soil. That's the worst thing you can do for soil biological activity. And then nowhere minimal use of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, uh, fungicides, neonicotinoids. The neonics are primarily used as a seed um, application. They put them onto the seeds before they plant them corn and soybean seeds uh, to keep them from rotting in the soil. But not only do they still kill soil biology, but they also, as you know, are uh, just very destructive to pollinators. And finally, uh, a lot of people think that all organic is regenerative and vice versa, and that's not true. A lot of organic farmers that I know are still tilling their soil. Um, they try to reduce the tillage, but it's still they're, they're tilling to kill weeds because they can't spray the weeds. Um, so there's some new practices that are becoming more commonplace that um, reduce that. And I know a lot of great regenerative farmers that are not organic. They, um, they use some herbicides to kill their cover crops. Um, obviously, we would like to not have any herbicides, but um, there's a lot of regenerative farmers that are not organic and vice versa. So a quick... Um, run through what we do at Allgrass Farms. So we're, um, our primary farm is located in Dundee, Illinois, near Elgin. Uh, we actually lease land from the Kane County Forest Preserve. I know there was discussion on that earlier, 160 acres that used to be in row crops. Uh, we've converted it in the last five years all into perennial pastures. On that land, as well as uh, we have another 400 acres now in southern Wisconsin that we farm, but we do produce 
um, 100 percent grass-fed beef uh, raw milk from a small herd of Guernsey cows and then we raise a lot of chickens on a pasture as well as turkeys eggs pork we have a couple of acres of organic vegetable production uh, during the growing season all of our livestock are rotated through the pastures uh, we move the beef cattle every day um, we move the dairy cows actually twice a day into fresh pastures and then the chickens are all moved daily we don't use any chemicals whatsoever no herbicides fungicides neonics uh, synthetic fertilizers uh, everything we feed is certified organic and locally produced and then a couple of pictures so here's our uh, beef herd grazing actually this is on our wisconsin farm um, it makes me long for the nice days hot days of summer um, we do have a lot of trees on this farm we have some oak savanna which is very useful you can see that this uh, this was one of the hotter days of the summer and so we give them the shade from those trees on that tree line there uh, and this year was kind of a weird year we had a drought uh, it's really severe drought up in our Wisconsin farm, um, but uh, we got a lot of rain in October. The grass came back. We thought we couldn't graze anymore, and we actually were able to graze all the way through December. I think this picture might have been taken the week before Christmas. Um, so this is uh, the advantage of a grazing system. Sometimes you get lucky. You can see some of the oaks with uh, in the background that have no leaves. Uh, we also raised... Uh, hens this is our egg laying flock uh, we do rotate them um, through the pastures that shelter you see in the background is on skid so we can move that there's a barely you can see it a portable electric fence that keeps them where we want to keep them and also keeps predators out um, we also raise turkeys a lot of them for thanksgiving you can see we have a guard dog in there with the turkeys uh, that's primarily for predator protection although she does help with the two-legged predators as well um, so we use her both with the turkeys in the fall and then she gets back in with the, uh, the laying hens uh, the rest of the year. Um, this is a great picture. I took this this summer. Uh, those shelters you see in the background, uh, those portable shelters we use for our broiler chickens, our meat chickens, uh, they're a little different than the laying hens. Uh, they're totally confined, but we move those shelters every day so they have essentially a new patch of grass uh, to forage in. They have no floors on them. Uh, but we had just pulled those shelters up through this pasture. This is a pasture we share with our beef cows, uh, our yearlings. And you can see the super green areas is where those shelters were. Uh, so that gives you an idea of um, this is probably about two to three weeks uh, they were on this patch, how much greener and how much fertility those chickens add to the pastures when we rotate those through. The cows love that green. We call that the candy grass. And pigs, we do raise pigs on pasture. The pigs get rotated uh, twice a week because they're a little harder to move, but uh, they are very good foragers. Um, it's a shame that you know most pigs are raised in concrete buildings or buildings with concrete floors where they can't uh, root or eat, but um, they uh, they love to forage and they will eat anything that's on the ground. So they're, uh, they're within really two feet of the ground. If we get them into some woods, they do great in woods about clearing out uh, brush and invasive species and then i should have mentioned this but we have a farm store at our dundee location and the only reason we can do all this is because we have a lot of loyal customers that have been with us for years and they line up every morning mostly to get milk because we have a very limited quantity of milk that usually sells out uh, but uh, really the only reason you can do is we get no government subsidies get no grants everything that we make comes from our customers and allows us to continue farming I did throw a quick picture in. I know Lindsay talked about cover crops. This is a great example of cover crops uh, after a, a corn harvest. And uh, this, I can't really see what this is. I just pulled it off the internet, but um, mostly they will grow through the winter, early spring. Uh, the farmer can term terminate them. A lot use herbicides. There are some uh, device called a roller crimper now that can be used to terminate, or some farmers are actually just planting right into um, some of these cover crops will die in the spring and they can plant the corn right into them or soybeans so finally i'm going to end on this uh really uh what you can do to support regenerative agriculture as lindsay talked about there's a cover crop program in illinois that's been very successful it's crazy that with so much data on how great 
uh, how effective cover crops are at not only reducing erosion, but building soil organic matter and adding fertility that every farmer doesn't use them. But I drive around a lot and I see just tons of bare soil in the winter and it's just, it boggles my mind. Um, so if we could get more support, so farmers could get the cover crops paid for, um, I think that would really help wider adoption of cover crops on a national level. Um, I'm not a big fan of regulation, but I think the, there's so much uh, misuse of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer that are, you know, polluting our waterways um, that I don't care what somebody does on their land, but if they're affecting their neighbors and obviously the rest of us, we should be able to get some limited regulations in place. Um, there are some great nonprofits like Lindsay's organization, as well as the Illinois Stewardship Alliance that we work with a lot that are uh, support regenerative ag. And then finally, um, what you can really do the most is to push money where your thoughts are and where your focus is, and that's on buying from local regenerative farms and not global food companies. Um, that's the only way that we're going to stop this because the global food companies right now dominate the agricultural sector and they buy off the politicians and it's really hard uh, to change anything at a, at a national level. Great, thank you so much, Cliff. And a lot of you, a lot of questions were, how can we buy this? Where do we go? Um, I put a link to the website for All Grass Farms in the chat, so you can find that directly and you can contact Cliff, or, or you can find where their store is, and he has their address on that website and their hours. Um, so Cliff, the first question is, is uh, does regenerative agriculture protect against invasive species such as the jumping worm? Uh, it does because really in a regenerative in a true regenerative system you are restoring the um, uh, native insect population which tends to keep things in balance where you really end up with these huge uh, pest problems especially things like corn and stuff is because you're you're not regenerative. So, for example, you plant corn every year. You're going to get pests that kill the corn, you know. Uh, and so, if you were if we're able to re restore some of the biodiversity, I think that typically does reduce uh, invasive pests because there's going to be some predator that's going to prey on them. Um, and so, really, this is this is a story about we got to restore our ecosystems to the natural balance that existed before we started destroying them with conventional agriculture. Good. That's good to hear. Um, do cattle feed in the wooded areas? Yes. So we do graze. I don't know if you you could see some woods. So we have about a 12 acre pretty thick woods on our Wisconsin farm. And we graze the cattle through there. That's part of the regular rotation. Um, they do eat a lot of the you know uh, invasive stuff that's close to the ground. Um, they'll eat leaves, they'll, they're browsers as well, but uh, they do clear through that area. And actually what we found is the more we graze the woods, the more productive they become. Interesting. In terms do, of opening them up, opening up the, um, the, you know, the ground cover. Do they, do they eat the invasive species in the woods too? Sure. I Good. mean, it's interesting people, things that we call weeds, the cows eat a lot of stuff, chicory. They love chicory. You know, a lot of people see chicory growing on the sides of the road. Yeah. Clover is the, one of their favorite foods. You know, there's a lot of forbs that people consider to be weeds that the cows love, and they have a lot of, uh, you know, healthy benefits in terms of uh, minerals and vitamins that they don't get from other grasses. Good. Um, um, the another question is, what percentage of the animals for food is forage versus uh, what you supply to them? So it really depends on the class of animal. For example, the uh, beef cows is 100%. They, we don't, everything that they get is forage or, and obviously we cut hay and then feed the hay, which is dried grass in the winter time. Uh, the dairy cows are about 90% forage. We do give them a small supplement of grain when they, only when they come in from milking and it has a lot of vitamins and minerals. That's our way of getting the minerals into them. Um, the chickens, you know, they are omnivores, they're not herbivores, they can't live on grass yeah. alone. Uh, but we probably, we estimate that we'll, we feed them about 70% of their intake is organic grain, 30% is uh, foraging. And really we look at that, that's kind of their salad bar. So if you were a human, you need your greens, that's really what the pasture gives to them, but they also need protein and energy from uh, the organic grains that we provide them. Interesting. Um, how many employees do you have on your farm? 
I think we have about 13. Now that includes, we have some people that just work in the store. Um, so I think we have eight, eight production employees on the farm right now. Farms, we have some that go back up to the Wisconsin farm. Yeah. Um, what, um, it says, what no-till regenerative principles have you used in your vegetable production gardens? So vegetable production is hard because of the fact that you got to prepare a seed bed. So um, we, and I will tell you that I am not the vegetable person. <laughs> I do not have a green thumb. We actually, one of our former employees uh, runs the vegetable operation. Okay. Um, and she is not, um, she has minimal tillage, but she actually does have to do a little bit of tillage to prepare a seed bed. Um, but, um, uh, but that's one area that we, we, we do have to do some tillage. Um, one of the questions was, what is the profit margin for regenerative agriculture versus traditional egg? You know, it's really all over the place, depending on the farmer um, and their production system. For us, you know, our goal is to earn a 10% profit margin on our revenue. So that allows us to reinvest. We've got, you know, plans to expand the store and, um, and actually build a creamery at our Wisconsin farm. But it really depends. I know the, the guys that have been doing it for years have figured out a system. They're the most profitable farms out there because they have very low inputs. They don't spend a lot for fertilizer or a lot of them zero. Yeah. Uh, they don't spend money on chemicals and they use uh, seeds that can be um, uh, that they can reproduce and, and plant. You know, they don't have to buy seeds every year. So it really it's all over the place but i would say the uh, the smart regenerative farms are making money nobody's getting rich in this business i can yeah. tell you that <laughs> yeah so yeah i've heard <laughs> it's all a goal you know if we can just survive and make a little bit of money that's really what most of us want to do so a lot of uh, the visitors or viewers i mean there's a lot in our area but there's a lot viewing from outside our area and the question was how do you find local farmers that practice that practice regenerative agriculture? Is there a, a website or a place they can go to look for them? There is there is a few. So there's one, Regeneration International, um, great organization. It's a global organization, has a list of farms all over the world, including the United States. So I would check out the re website, Regeneration International. Eatwild.com has a list of Illinois farms, probably 50 or 60. Uh, they're packed, that are all similar to what ours, and, and that's a, actually a national listing. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a few. Um, those are the two that I think of off the top of my head. But if you were to, you know, just Google regenerate, uh, regenerative agriculture, regenerative farms, you'll probably find more. Uh, you just have to check them out because everybody that says they're regenerative isn't necessarily regenerative. So you got to do your due diligence. Okay, good to know. And it, just a plug for ours, we have an organic farm at the Conservation Foundation, and it's, uh, it's a, our 40 acres of it are all organic and it's a local uh, you can go to our website and find out we sell shares and you can uh, uh, purchase those and uh, get your own local uh, veg vegetables um, it says a question was uh, do, you, do your pastures work for nesting grassland birds just curious if you see any uh, grassland birds there we have a lot of grassland birds um, what we do it's uh, we do not we do graze the obviously the fields but we don't cut any hay or mow until July 1st, so that gives most of the nesting birds a chance to get the the, the ground nesting birds a chance to get their um, uh, chicks uh, up and around before we we would cut any hay. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the balance, you know. I, I know that the grazing animals will disturb the birds, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of birds that follow the the cows around. It's interesting. Um, so we have a lot of birds that follow the cows around and and you know eat off of their. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the insects that come up, up across the cow patty. So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. Good, good. That's interesting. That's good to hear. Um, it says, could you please comment on uh, buffalo? How much land do they need uh, and how many acres per buffalo? I don't know if you know that answer. <laughs> oh. Well, I don't have any idea about bi bison. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a bison expert. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. The one question is, uh, aren't the chickens also eating bugs while they forage? Yes, they are. Good. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole cycle, which is great it can right. stick for the whole thing. Um, would you, it says, would you recommend Regeneration International Farm Map? I guess that. Yes, yes, they okay. do have a good farm map. 
Okay. And, um, and it works. Uh, it works well. I mean, I haven't been on the website for a while, but I do know that um, they do have a listing of a lot of farms there. Okay. Um, and they do some. I don't know how we, we did never apply for it, but they must have gotten us on there in some manner. So um, they probably oh, go out. I think they pick regenerative farms and add them to their map. We also had a couple of questions in the chat that I I wanted to get out there. Um, one was, have you tried any native grasses that would support other wildlife in addition to the ag? Um, we we have in the past that one of the challenges with uh, the native prairie grasses is that they're super slow to get established. However, the one of the advantages of them, they act, you know most of the pastures that we plant, um, they'll convert. We get some natives growing in after a few years. Uh, because we've taken pretty much all corn and bean land and we we had to plant, um, you know, we would plant a diverse species mix, probably eight to 10. But um, in the past, we haven't used a lot of natives just because they're slow, so slow to establish. But there is um, a 20 acre pasture that we're going to renovate this year. And we're thinking about planting um, uh, some native prairie grasses uh, that are warm season, which because they would probably give us more production in the heat of the summer. Most of what we plant is cool season grasses. And so um, we'd like to be able to, you know, have some areas of the farm that are really productive in the summer. And some of those natives are very productive in the summer. That's good to hear. So with that, uh, we are out of time. Uh, we, If you have questions, please email Jamie or I, and we'll try and get you those answers. And I wanna keep us moving here and thank you, Cliff. I know he's been out, it's super cold here and he's been out there, he had to take a break and go feed the cows. So I appreciate you taking a break and, and helping us uh, present all your information to everyone out there. There's a lot of, hopefully you get some customers that'll come visit you. Sure, it sounds great, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Cliff. Uh, I, with that, I'm, next is uh, Jennifer Hammer, who is on our staff. She's the Director of Watershed Programs and Ecological Restoration. Um, her Her, title of her presentation is Relationships, Resiliency, and Rivers. Long-term project increases opportunities for fish and paddlers. With that, I'm turning it over to Jennifer. All right, um, can you see my screen, Jan? Yes, I can see it. Okay, awesome. All right, I wanna thank everybody for sticking around for the last presentation of the day. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna kind of move from our ter ter terrestrial landscapes um, that the speakers uh, this morning here have been talking about and uh, kind of moves down into the water. And, all right, there we go. Um, so the project I'm gonna talk about today is a dam removal uh, that was done this past year at Hamill Woods uh, Forest Preserve uh, in Shorewood, just north of Route 52 on the DuPage River. And um, it has been a project that's been, been on our minds for a long time. When I first started with the foundation back in uh, 1998. Uh, I think the following summer, uh, Brooke and I and uh, Mike Pasteris, who'd been the uh, board chairman or board executive director of the Will County Forest Preserve District at the time, took a canoe trip down uh, the main stem DuPage and, you know, had some discussions around this dam. But at the time, there just, there wasn't funding, there wasn't the political will, um, but it, it just sort of hung out there as, as something that, you know, we definitely needed to tackle. Um, and so as we've been talking about resiliency and, and building that back into our landscapes, um, one of the other ways that, that I like to think about resiliency is, is all the people and, and organizations out there who have been working um, on various aspects of this uh, for good portions of their careers. Um, and the, the fact that having those organizations around and pushing through you know, the various challenges uh, through the years to make these projects happen um, is really an important component of that sort of resiliency uh, that we're looking for on the landscape. Um, the project itself is, is really, it's, it removes a barrier. Um, and they're just like fragmentation that happens, uh, you know, when we put a, a road through uh, a forest or, or a prairie or any kind of uh, upland habitat, uh, a dam does the same thing. It fragments the habitat, uh, fish can't move, from uh, one part of the river to the other, it closes off access to uh, breeding grounds, uh, you know, breeding areas that they may have gotten up in the smaller tributaries upstream, uh, but it also damages the habitat right there at the dam. Uh, so covering up habitat, uh, because the water slows down and so sediment's able to drop out, 
uh, water temperatures rise and the water's warmer, it can't hold as much oxygen, more sediment draws more oxygen out of water. Uh, so we're just kind of really creating poor habitats um, for, for fish and insects uh, that live in the water. And so here again, uh, most, you know, this is a relatively small uh, dam. It's only about six, less than six feet high um, once they drained all the water out of it. Uh, but it definitely impacted movement of fish. Um, it felt wasn't terrible behind this dam because there was enough flow uh, through here to, to, to push out a lot of the heavy silt, but there's a lot of the, you know, like sands and small gravels that, that really filled in all the spaces between the rocks and, and impacted uh, some of those breeding areas for fish. Um, but it also created a dangerous uh, condition for recreation activities. Um, you can't see it in the picture here, but the, there's a, there used to be a pullout upstream of the dam here so the canoers could get around the dam. Uh, but through the years, a number of people have actually drowned at this dam. Uh, the two most recent ones, there were two people um, that drowned in April of 2020. Um, I don't know they were, I don't know if they were in a, in a canoe. I'm not sure exactly how or why they were on the water at that time of year, but the guy went under and his girlfriend went in to try to help him out and they both ended up drowning. So, I mean, this is not an uncommon story um, around even some of our smaller low head dams in our region. Um, and speaking of dams, just in general, in the, in the DuPage River watershed, We've actually had a number of dam removal projects upstream in the West Branch, um, at Dow Grove and Warrenville Grove, on the East Branch at Churchill Woods. Uh, there's one large dam remaining, uh, the Faywell Dam uh, on the West Branch. It's a little different because it's a water control structure, uh, but there's actually some uh, a project that's been under planning for uh, quite some time now, but I think we'll finally get something in the river, um, hopefully sometime this year, but a fish passage project uh, to, to move fish up into areas upstream of uh, that Warrenville area. Um, unfortunately, Han the Sh Shanahan Dam, the dam that's in Shanahan um, at the state park there, will not be removed because it actually blocks passage of um, Asian carp from getting up into the DuPage River system. Um, but there's 18 species of fish that are only found below that dam and not in any other part of the watershed. So we can see how these structures definitely impact um, fish movement. And the kind of unfortunate thing about having, you know, these dams in place that, that won't go anywhere is there's been miles of stream restoration projects upstream uh, and the east, all the way up into the east and west branches of the DuPage River, um, as well as other projects on the, on the main stem that really are, you know, creating a, a much more favorable habitat. Um, and we just need to find ways to get, get the good fish up there. Um, for this particular project here, we know that from studies that we've been doing since 2012, uh, as well as other data from the DNR, that there are at least eight species of fish that uh, are found, that had been found only up to the, the Hamill Woods Dam. Um, and so we're hoping to see these uh, species of fish moving upstream uh, as we continue to do our monitoring and uh, included a few pictures here from the DNR website. The two top ones, the log perch and the slenderhead, and they're small little fish, a couple inches long. Um, so there's no way they were you know, getting over any kind of a dam structure. This is again, kind of part of that first uh, thoughts around resiliency that I was talking about in that you know, there's a lot of organizations and people that have been, involved, been involved in this project uh, over the last 20 years to, to really make it a reality. Projects like this don't just happen. They take a long time for the data to be collected, to get the support for a project, to get the funding in place for a project. Um, and that really came uh, from you know, these, these top organizations here, the Forest Preserve District of Will County, they own the dam and the Forest Preserve District around it. Um, they really contributed a lot from their staff uh, to coordinate the design and engineering of the project, uh, oversee all of the construction. Uh, they added some components of their own to the project with a new, uh, new canoe launch that I had a picture of on my first slide there. Um, the Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition, uh, who's, they're celebrating their 10th year um, this year in uh, really collecting data and helping to guide 
projects like this uh, to improve water quality within the watershed. Um, we've been involved with the Lower DuPage uh, for many years, uh, and that's why part of why I have kind of some of the, the smaller logos there on the bottom of the IEPA and the Conservation 2000 program that contributed funds uh, to help get the organization, well, A, to get a watershed plan put in place, to get the organization sort of up and running, uh, the C2000 grant that the Conservation Foundation received back in 2000, 2001, uh, to actually study impacts of dams within the DuPage River, really started laying the foundation uh, for this project. The work of the DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group, not only with the data collection that they're doing and the restoration work that they're doing in the upper portions of the watershed, but also the work uh, that was done in negotiating uh, some special conditions in uh, the permits of the wastewater treatment facilities that allowed those facilities to contribute to projects like this uh, while we were trying to figure out some of the best ways to, to deal with uh, water quality issues. And so we were able to, um, we're a part of that as a lower due page. Um, and so funding for this project came through uh, those negotiations and permit conditions that, that the DRCW was uh, you know, really key in the pulling together. And then some great support uh, from the IDNR, uh, particularly Steve Pesciatelli uh, and the late Bob Rung, who have been um, beacons for the last 20 years uh, out there, really kind of beating the, beating the drum for, uh, for dam removal and putting that support out there to get projects like this done. So with all that background and kind of all the people who've been involved to make this project a reality, uh, kind of give you some context. So here is a picture of the whole watershed. And so we have the east and west branches as they flow through DuPage County, forming the main stem of the DuPage River uh, that goes into the Displains down on in Shanahan. And that is a, the approximate location of the dam that was removed. So. Uh, by removing that dam, we've opened up, you know, basically over 50 miles of uh, stream, 50 stream miles opened up to fish migration and movement. And then I am going to share my screen again to show you a video that was put together, um, kind of really gives some nice background and a, a lot of great shots of the project itself. The video was put together by the Will County Forest Preserve District. Again, like I said, they've been an awesome partner uh, with this project, not just to you know, get the con construction done, but having a lot of great information uh, out there for uh, residents and uh, trail goers and things like that. So let me pull up that video. removal of the Hamill Woods Dam sure to generate a lot of interest from the public and we are happy to say that this project was executed swiftly and safely with a positive impact on the DuPage River for years to come not only here in Hamill Woods but throughout Will County. While removal happened in just a matter of weeks planning for this project took years in coordination with other organizations such as the Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition and the Conservation Foundation. Funding was made possible with a grant from the Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition. The coalition is made up of municipalities and park districts along the DuPage River in Will County. So I work for the Conservation Foundation and I provide staffing to the Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition. as a partnership that we have between our two organizations uh, because we can do more together uh, than we can do individually. This project has been really a keystone project for the coalition. Uh, to remove this dam and increase access uh, and, and movement of fish up into the upper parts of the watershed, uh, helping to improve our, our water quality and health of our aquatic uh, ecosystems. The dam was constructed in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a work program uh, funded by the federal government. 
They constructed the dam originally to create a pool of water for recreational uses, and those would have, have included both fishing as well as swimming and other activities that were in the water. Back in the early 2000s, the Conservation Foundation had uh, received grant funding through the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Conservation 2000 program to really look at what the impacts of dams were in the DuPage River system. So we looked at dams along the main stem of the DuPage and up into the east and west branches of the DuPage River and identified a number of dams that really uh, served no purpose any longer. Um, and so through that study, we identified um, a number of dams, including this one here, uh, that really, like I said, pose no additional benefit as far as flood control um, or you know stormwater management or anything like that, and really could be slated for removal to improve uh, the health of our streams. Based on the studies that they had done, we're able to show that the ecology of the river was different downstream than it was upstream of the dam. That was confirmation for what a lot of people suspected and that was that the dam created an impediment to the free flow of fish and other species uh, in the river. So it's not often that we get to, to uh, do restoration in a stream or in a river. We do do that of course in, in, at times. So uh, most of our restoration work is terrestrial or land-based. It's a little bit different, uh, quite a bit different than some of our other uh, what I would say run-of-the-mill or, or standard projects that we do that sometimes require only one or maybe two permits and they're local permits rather than federal and state permits. While some people objected to the removal of the dam because they had personal connections to it, now there are different opportunities for visitors to create new memories in the spot. Part of our human nature is, is to re, you know, be a little resistant to change, but this change reflects what we've learned uh, about the river and that these types of structures are really bad uh, for the health of the river. It, it creates this wall. And so, um, you know, although this is something different, it is something new to embrace because we are gonna continue to see uh, really great things from this project. So with this project, um, unlike a lot of other ones, is that the contractor is basically under the gun as soon as they get in river, right? So as soon as we got mobilized and the coffer dam systems were put in place, the contractor needs to go as fast as they physically can um, and still do you know a, a quality job while they're doing it, so that they can get out of the river before you know potential heavy rains happen and either take existing equipment with it or just mess up the whole entire program and set you back weeks, if not months, in the process. As soon as material and everything gets out on site, tree clearing happens, and then the next thing that happened with the project was the coffer dam system, which was uh, established by a company called Porta Dam that's out of the Northeast. Um, they're a subcontractor in the project. They got in river. And they would set up their, um, their structure, if you will, as a steel frame, uh, and bolt that into the bedrock. And as soon as everything was secure, we did it on a, a half river system, right? So we isolated half of the river uh, during phase one, and phase two is the second half. But as soon as the structure was up, they would peel over a vinyl tarp and put down uh, sandbags to seal the, you know, the river's edge portion of that, pump the water out, as soon as the water is to a level that we can get equipment in there, um, that's when the heavy equipment would come in and either you know, um, uh, jackhammer out or excavate out the existing material in the dam. The removal of this dam along the DuPage River is really important because it's going to allow fish passage all the way up into the upper reaches of the east and west branch of the DuPage River, uh, especially as the watershed groups up there have actually you know, re already removed dams. And so this will be really a way to, to get that extension all the way up into the DuPage County portions of this watershed. So in addition to just the dam removal itself, you'll notice that there are a number of large boulders and stones put in place uh, in the river. That's to help create better habitat for fish and macroinvertebrates in the stream. Most dams were built on uh, spots of the river that already had a riffle, uh, so likely there was a riffle in this spot. 
and th that just adds to the diversity of habitat in the stream, uh, allowing for more places for fish and macroinvertebrates, the bugs in the stream, to, to find habitat and, and expand their populations. Uh, so that riffle is, a, is an important component of the uh, restoration part of this project. While the removal of the dam and the attach overlook are the changes you'll immediately see while visiting, the shoreline will evolve over time. So when people come back in the spring, everything's going to be a little bit taller, but with everything that was seeded, it's a woodland uh, seeding mix, so it's going to be taller grasses. And this is actually part of our view shed management program as well. So the idea with this is to be able to see the river from the parking lot, have a direct connection when you come here. Uh, so there'll just be some tall grasslands that get in there. It'll take a couple years to establish the trees that have a, a, a canopy over the top of them. And uh, you'll be able to sit on the, the river's edge, throw your kayak in the water, and paddle around. In the long term, we'll start seeing more animal diversity and overall improved river ecosystems. These partner organizations have already seen results based on previous dam removals up north. We pretty much started to see immediate increases in uh, fish as they moved up well beyond even what we expected. Uh, fish moving up into species of fish that were only found kind of between this dam and the, the dam up in, um, in the Warrenville area. There are a few dams up there. I'm really only seeing those fish here be in, in between those dams. Once they remove those dams upstream, they started immediately seeing fish moving upstream uh, on the East Branch at Churchill Woods. Uh, fish movement uh, within that same season and then into the years after it. So we really do expect to see movement of fish uh, really rather quickly. Even though, you know, there is a lot of initiatives and a lot of studies to get something like this done, you have to have the will to do it and the longevity to permit it as well as to pay for it. Thank you. I'll get back to my screen here. So just want to let folks know if um, you'd like to share that video uh, with anyone, you can find it on the uh, Will County Forest Preserve uh, YouTube channel. Um, probably easiest place to find find that video and be able to share it with folks. I think they did a, a great job of, of really kind of pulling all the pieces of the project together, showing a lot of great uh, uh, you know shots. They have their drones out there and uh, have some great staff to pull all that together. So that is all I had. Um, I don't know if we had any questions, Jan, um, or if people can just send those uh, any yeah. questions to me. Uh, yeah, actually, we, we do have some questions and we do have some time here and I'm, I want to get some of these questions answered that people sure. have. Um, is there any hope of eradicating the Asian carp from our waterways? Probably not. <laughs> a simple answer. I, I, I don't, you know, that some of the, a lot of work and effort is uh, being put into to seeing if we can stop the movement of them going upstream up on the displays. Um, but it is, it is unlikely. Um, okay, so, so we had another question. Um, what can we do as homeowners to improve our conservation and water quality going into the drainage? Sure. Um, so I think implementing a lot of the things that were discussed earlier today uh, through like our conservation at home program um, or just incorporating more native plants into into your yard, thinking about where drainage is coming off of, you know, your homes, uh, that it's not just going down your driveway, uh, infiltrating that water basically where it falls um, and, and keeping it from carrying pollutants down to the stream. And if you live along a stream, you know, to think about having uh, some sort of a buffer strip of native plants where you're not mowing, you're not fertilizing, uh, definitely not dumping leaves or grass clippings or things like that into uh, streams or ditches, things that lead to, to our waterways. And then, um, you know, looking at your, your chemical use, um, you know, whether or not you really need to be fertilizing or using pesticides on your lawn. Again, like I said, pretty much all of the things that were discussed earlier today um, are all things that are going to benefit the uh, health and well-being of our rivers and streams. Basically, everything that happens on the land impacts our rivers one way or another. Yeah, yeah that's an excellent point. And it, 
another shout out for the webinars. Um, our December webinar was actually about how you can um, take care of your own watershed, how to be a better neighbor to your watershed. So check out our YouTube channel for a, um, an entire hour long webinar on that topic as well. Someone asked, uh, has any work been done on the Fox River? Yes. <laughs> Simple answer, yes. Yes. Um, there are a number of organizations that, uh, including park districts, uh, that have been doing various projects um, along the Fox River. There's been a couple of dam removals that have happened. Uh, I think there's a few other dam removal projects that are also under planning, um, as well as uh, a, a work looking at how to reduce impacts of nutrients. Uh, on the Fox River itself. And then uh, a number of the park districts uh, that I know Dan Lobus on our staff works with uh, that have been acquiring uh, lands along the Fox River to keep them, make them public um, and look at how they're managed uh, also to protect the river. Good. I, I was gonna say, we work with a lot of those organizations. Mm -hmm. So Nancy wants to know, is there an impact on flooding with the removal of dams? Does it minimize it, increase it or no effect? So the question's somewhat dependent on the dam. Uh, for a dam like this particular one here, it really should have absolutely no impact um, as far as you know, any kind of an increase of flooding. Um, it is possible that we will actually uh, see some benefits um, because now that the water level is lower by a little bit, um, there is now exposed area for water to go when the water is, you know, getting back up into those high flow situations. Uh, so we have a little bit more space uh, within the forest preserve area for water to kind of hang out uh, during those high flow, high flow times. Um, some dam removal projects can actually um, really have some positive impacts, again, because they're creating storage, because where water normally is, um, that, that it, when, when it floods, now you're working from that level up, but when you can lower that water level down and can reconnect to uh, existing floodplain areas, uh, then you just create more storage. And I'm gonna to jump to this question. Um, someone said that they stopped putting chemicals and fertilizers on their lawn six years ago, and they live along Jackson Creek, and they're asking about mm -hmm. putting their grass clippings along the shore. Should they re refrain from doing that? And I'll let Jennifer take that one. I know she has the answer. Yes. The simple answer is yes. Basically, um, you know, there is a natural amount of, of um, leaves and things that make their way to the stream. But it's just part of nature. But when we really sort of accelerate that amount by dumping lawn clippings um, or leaves or things like that, we're putting in large amounts of a source of nutrients. Um, and that just adds to the amount of algae growth uh, that we see in our streams and, and then sort of the cascading effects from that with uh, decreasing the amount of oxygen uh, that's, that's available to aquatic life. In addition to that, when you're dumping land, uh, land, any kind of landscaping waste along the edge of the stream, you're smothering out the plants that we really want to be growing there that help to hold that shoreline in place, stabilize it, and filter out um, you know, things that, that flow or are carried with, with storm water and things like that across the, the landscape. Uh, so yeah, definitely, you know, look towards either just mulching, <laughs> um, you know, using a mulching mower so that you're not collecting uh, grass clippings or you putting those grass clippings uh, in your compost, you know, mixing them with leaves and other things. Because um, I know, I mean, we, we do our best to not collect grass clippings at all uh, at home, but sometimes, you know, that time of year when the grass is just growing so fast <laughs> or you have kids that are playing out in the grass and then they're coming into the house, tracking in all kinds of grass clippings, um, you know, that can be a challenge. And so looking for other ways uh, to utilize those either in your compost or things like that, um, or uh, in your, you know, landscape pickup, uh, landscape waste pickup that may be provided through your community. Definitely not along the banks of, of any of our streams. Another question asks, um, will removing that dam enable Asian carp to migrate up the DuPage River? So not this dam, because we are not finding any Asian carp between the Shanhan Dam and where the Hamel Woods Dam was. So currently, uh, the, the dam down in Shanahan 
on the DuPage River at the, uh, the INM Canal State Park. Um, it is quite tall. I want to say at least nine to 12 feet. Um, so there are fish, there are no fish that, that get past it. Um, and that is really part of the reason why that dam won't come out uh, is to keep, keep Asian carp out of the DuPage. Great. And the last question, can you stop fish above the dams? I don't know who they're asking because we don't stock fish, but the foresters I know stock their lakes. Oh, stock fish about the stock. dams. I'm sorry, yes. I thought you said stop. <laughs> no, stock, stock. Um, so there, there is actually some work um, that's you know, definitely underway. Um, some of the goals of the restoration projects uh, that are ongoing um, in, you know, in addition to the dam removal projects that the DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group is, is working on some uh, different restoration projects. The Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition is actually just embarking on a, a, a second project that we're just getting started on uh, in the main stem in the Plainfield area. Uh, work that the Forest Preserve Districts, both DuPage County and Will County are doing. So we're creating all this habitat um, that we really are hoping we'll be able to support some of these other species. And then, you know, looking at how we may be able to um, collect fish from below the dam, our native species, look at different ways, look at the potential of propagating them potentially uh, up in DuPage County at the, the River Resource Center there. Um, and then being able to release them as part of these restoration projects. Um, that's a long process uh, and definitely, you know, requires some permits from the DNR and their willingness to allow, you know, allow that to be done. Uh, so that's all, all definitely part of some of the long-term planning is, you know, since we can't take this dam out, are there ways that we can move uh, some of these species, reintroduce them back upstream? Great. So that's all the questions we have today. I just want to close in comments. We will be sending out this recording. And along with that, we'll be sending some links to some upcoming webinars that we have going on. We also had a native plant sale and vegetable sale coming up. Uh, that'll start in April and the sale will be it's a pre-order and pickup at our office. Um, and also I want to thank our sponsors, DuPage Foundation, Bedrock Earthscape, Cool DuPage, the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County, and uh, Christopher, B, Christopher B. Burke Engineering. And Jamie, do you have any additional comments? No, I just want to thank all of our presenters today, as well as all of you for attending. Um, this has probably been one of our biggest events thus far. I know we hit our 500 attendee limit, so apologies if anybody ran into that. But um, thank you all so much for giving us your morning. And I, I hope everyone got a lot out of it. I know I did. Um, so thanks, everybody. Yeah, with that, thank um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of our speakers. I really appreciate it. And thank you for everyone in attendance. We'll be getting you that information. Have a wonderful day and the rest of the week. Thank you. Just keep warm. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.